Chapter 1, Prologue, In a New World Author's Note, This is my first fanfiction story. Any criticisms and suggestions are appreciated. Giangu, Sealmaster, Rina Tensei Sharingan Naritok's Harem Extremely AU for Naruto and slightly AU for Avengers. The Ruins of Yuzushiogakure Well, I guess this is it, huh? Naruto said with a sad voice. We know it's gonna happen someday. It's just a matter of when. Karama said. Standing in the ruins of the home of his ancestors. Naruto stood in front of gate with its doors covered in writing. He wore a dark orange jacket over a black long sleeve shirt. He also wore a modified black umbu pants with multiple pockets and a pair of brown boots. His long bright blonde hair is covered by the hood of his jacket. After the defeat of Kagaya Atsutsuki, a short period of peace has been observed in the elemental nations. Countries and hidden villages alike are working hand in hand to recover from the disasters caused by the Fourth Great Shinobi War. But of course, it wouldn't last long. Everybody knew it. It only takes a single spark of human greed and hates to reverse all the progress achieved. Nobody knew better how fickle human nature is than Naruto Uzumaki Namakaze. The last heir of the Senju and Uzumaki clans, clans from his mother's side, Kushina Uzumaki, and the last heir of the Namakaze clan and member of the Uchiha clan from his father's side, the Yandame Hokage Minato Namakaze. As a kid, Naruto has always been the target of hate by the citizens of Konoha due to his unique circumstances. He was chosen as the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi by his own father after it escaped from its previous vessel, his mother. Naruto was raised ignorant from his own heritage by the order of the Sandame Hokage, Hiruzen Sarutobi. Naruto became the target of scorn and hatred of the ignorant masses due to him being the prison of the Kyubi. Only recently has this outlook been changed due to his role in the Fourth Shinobi War and the defeat of Kagaya Atsutsuki. Tired of the cycle of hatred, Naruto trained hard to overcome the challenges that the path to peace would face. He became the foremost master of Fuinjutsu, acquired the ultimate Dojutsu Rina Tensei Sharingan, or simply called Shinigan, became the first full sage, and acquired the Takigakure's famed Kenjutsu, the Jiangu all after the war. He also set out to allow himself to become the Jinchuriki of the Nine Bishu. Shikaku, Matatabi, Isabu, Son Goku, Kokuo, Saiken, Komiai, Yuki, and Karama. This would ensure that the power of the Bijou wouldn't be abused by any hidden village, and would allow some form of freedom to the Bijou due to his modified Death God Seal that allows partial autonomy of the Bijou inside the seal. An unforeseen side effect of all the power he acquired was that he became essentially immortal. An overreaction to his predicament, he decided to leave the world he has known, and live a relatively normal life in another world. He dedicated his knowledge of Fuinjutsu and near limitless amount of chakra in his disposal, be created a bridge to another world. Packing up everything he would need and saying one last goodbye to the only world he has known, the 21-year-old Naruto, the hero of the elemental nations, left the world in a flash of light so bright it rivaled the sun, without so much as a goodbye to his friends and families. Central Park, New York, USA, 2005 That is the worst duration ever. Naruto shouted with a fervor. Shut up. If it's bad for you, how about for us in here? Chomei replied with equal enthusiasm. I guess it's a success since we're not dead Gyuki added with mirth. Kit, we need to get out of here. We may have attracted some unwanted attention with our exit Karama advised. Yeah yeah. I'm going. Shish Naruto said. Applying suppression seals on his nape to cover his chakra signature, he left the scene in as much speed and stealth he could muster without chakra enhancements. Hiding in the shadows of the trees around him, he noticed there are paths and structures in the forest. On second thought, it's not a forest but a large park. Who the hell makes a park the size of Kanoha? 
Naruto thought to himself. It took ten seconds for him to reach the clearing of the park. Still hiding from the shadows, Naruto took notice of the world he landed on. What he saw awed and surprised him. Buildings higher than the Hokage Monument everywhere, carriages running without horses or ox, bright lights that reach for the sky and people, lots and lots of people. All were looking towards where he came from. Holy shit Isabu drawled out. Imagine climbing one of those. Son Goku blurted out. You're really just big monkey, aren't you? Kokuo teased. We need a base of operations while we figure out how this world works. Saiken said. Yeah. Let me try something. I feel we are still not far enough from where we came. Naruto said. Getting Horatian Kanai from his pocket, he threw it hard at a 45-degree angle to maximize distance and to miss any buildings in its immediate path. When he felt the Kanai stopped, he asked Kurama, any people near where that Kanai landed? None from what I can tell. Kurama replied. Okay, here goes nothing. With a flash of light, he's gone. Chapter 2, Blinding Light Author's Note Hi, I'm back. Leave a review to make this fanfic better. The Triskelion, Washington, D.C. March 28, 2005, 2115 H. Local An unassuming man is moving quickly down the corridor to report to his boss. Tension can clearly be seen even if he is feigning a calm exterior. Everyone can see it, causing them to move aside to let him through. He's a Caucasian wearing tailored suit and black leather shoes. He has dark brown hair and a receding hairline. He is Agent Phil Coulson. The right-hand man of the Director of the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, or SHIELD. An expert in information gathering, stealth, and diplomacy, he has already seen more things than people would believe, and can keep his calm through even some of the most chaotic of scenarios. He is generally considered an easygoing individual, with a great sense of humor. To find him reacting this way would mean an entirely unprecedented event occurred. Reaching his destination, he knocked twice and entered the office. He saw his boss pacing back and forth behind his desk while talking on the phone. Yes, Mr. President. We already have a quick response team on site, with a secondary team en route. Yes. Yes, sir, we'll send an update when able. Goodbye, sir. Facing Coulson is an intimidating bald African-American man. He is wearing an all-black combat attire covered by a black leather trench coat. Another notable characteristic is a black eye patch covering his left eye covering a large scar running across it. What the hell happened, Coulson? I had to find out in 083 event from POTUS. Good thing we had people close by who at least had the brains to check it out and take control, control of the situation. Now I'm going to ask with all the calm that I can muster. What the fuck is going on? The man known as Nick Fury asked, finally ending his tirade. Nicholas Fury, or simply known as Nick Fury, is the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. S.H.I.E.L.D. is formed to protect the world from things they are not ready to know, and at its head is the quintessential spy. If one thinks of spies, he is what usually forms in your head. He's an expert on deep infiltration, espionage, and assassination. He had toppled governments, assassinated world leaders. Basically, he changed the world. There isn't much known about him, and that's the way he likes it. Handing over a tablet that contains the information on the event, Coulson answered the tirade like a professional. On 2030 hours, an energy surge was recorded on the north side of Central Park. Our sensors didn't record the event since the energy surge is what would be considered harmless. The event just released the energy as purely visible light, which is really strange. Accidental recording of the event, which is already circling social media, 
showed that the light emitted exceeds the brightness of the sun. A large number of people who were accidentally looking at the direction, as it happened, are already checking into hospitals due to visual issues. The teams on site are already cordoning off the area with the help of local law enforcement. Our New York branch techs are just three minutes away. While looking at the tablet, Fury is formulating a plan of attack and running multiple scenarios in his head. With a plan formed, he ordered Coulson. I want you on a flight to New York with our tech with all the toys you can bring. Take another ten agents for investigation and bring Barton with you. He can see things others don't. A commercial or private? Coulson asked. A hardened stare is an answer he received. Right, the Quinjet it is. I'll just get going then, sir. I'll send Romanoff as your relief team as soon as she gets back from California. Coulson nodded and walked out of the office, readying himself for another mission. The Triskelion, Washington, D.C. March 28, 2005, 2145 H. Local. Agent Clint Barton is in a meeting room waiting to be briefed about an urgent mission he just been informed about. He is already on his way to the dormitories after his daily workout and conditioning when he has been called back through his phone. He really would like to complain about his working hours if only he had one. Being a high-level shield agent meant that he had irregular hours and can be called at any time. He already changed into his standard sleeveless shield combat uniform. His trusty weapon in a carry case beneath the table. Some would describe Agent Barton's serious guy on a mission, but easygoing and relatable off of it. He is also considered a special kind of prodigy. He has a recorded eyesight of 25, near-perfect recall, and an outstanding eye-to-hand coordination. A master marksman in most conventional weaponry by 18, and a gifted infiltrator specializing in assassination and bodyguard missions. What makes people consider him a little weird is his choice of weaponry, which is the bow and arrow. Shield Tech has upgraded his choice of weapon to allow him to deal with many situations with just a change of the arrow tip that can be remotely changed. Looking around the room, he counted 20 people in the room, excluding himself. Based on his observations, 10 of them are definitely field agents, and the other 10 are techs. Ha, huh, this looks like big op with this many. Field agents, but why in the hell do we need this many techs? Barton thought to himself. Technicians or techs are their scientists. They usually stay in the labs, but certain circumstances may need them. He tapped the shoulder of the field agent in front of him and asked. Got, got any idea what all this is about? Um, no, sir. I have just been called from leave. I haven't even started yet. Ah, uh, sir. The agent answered in a nervous tone when he recognized who was asking him. Not receiving any information, he spied a tech looking in his phone. He walked over to the tech at the other side of the room, Barton asked. You have any news about the op? I may have some idea, Agent Barton. The tech answered. All the people in the room are now focused on the conversation. Well? Agent Barton urged the tech to continue. Ah, yes. Browsing at his phone. At approximately 8.30 this evening, a bright flashlight was observed at Central Park. Showing the video playing on his phone to the audience in the room. Since our sensors didn't record any spike either in infrared, UV, radiation, or otherwise, the only explanation left is that the event is just like a large flashlight only just a few stops brighter than the sun. We are currently unable to form any hypothesis about the event. Well, that's basically the gist of what I'm gonna say. A new voice was heard from the doorway. Everybody swung their heads to who it is. Hey, Phil. You're the one who called us in? Barton asked. Coulson walked over to the podium and said, no. Orders came from Fury himself with urging from the president. 
Wow. So this is a big deal, huh? When are we going to go? In half an hour. I want everyone to pack for at least a week. Bring all the sensors, machines, or doodads that you may need, and you might think unavailable at the New York field office. We're going to take a Quinjet to our hotel and start tomorrow morning. Carlson ordered. You heard him. Let's go. Barton urged the people in in the room when no one stood up. The people in the room started to file out quickly to prepare for travel. How bad is it? Barton asked Carlson with a touch of worry in his voice. Not as bad as you might think. Carlson significantly calmed down from his earlier state. It is considered an 083 event. It just caused minor panic to the populace. You know, New York. If it doesn't affect them, they don't care. The president is just concerned since he's going to run for re-election, and New York is one of his big bases. What concerns Fury, on the other hand, is what we should worry about. We have no idea what caused the event. Zilch, zero, nada. Remember what the tech said about the sensors? Yeah. What's so special about it? Nothing was recorded about the event. No spikes in the infrared, UV, or radiation. That just doesn't happen. No phenomenon, artificial or natural, can form this amount of visible light without some byproduct. Even a flashlight produces heat. Carlson explained. So, what is your take on this? Cause my money's on aliens. Barton offered his opinion. Maybe, but I doubt it. My gut says it's going to big. Well, shit. How many times is your gut wrong? Not much. Well, I hope you're wrong. They separate from each other at the corridor's intersection, with a sense of foreboding on what is to come. Chapter three. Not stealthy enough. Mojave Desert, California, 2005. A man suddenly in the middle of the desert. God damn it, Karama! Why didn't you tell me it landed that fucking far? I really hate those long-range hurations. Naruto complained. Well, you didn't ask. At least it's not as bad as that huration gate you made. That's just a doozy. Karama replied. Oh. I really like this place. Can we stay here, please? Shikaku said with extreme enthusiasm. No way. Only you can love this place, Sandbrain. Isaba countered. Ha! What did you just say? All right. Shut up. Gyuki roared at the two. Naruto looked around and observed where he landed. It looked like he landed in the middle of a desert. The sun is just setting, leaving a beautiful image to behold. There are no structures anywhere in sight, only some mountain ranges on the horizon. He looked down on his feet and saw a small crater only half a foot in diameter. At the center, his Hiration Kanai. Thanks, Yuki. We're not going to stay here, Isabu. There's almost nothing here. It might be perfect for a base if we're hiding, but we need information. Karama, can you figure out where are the largest cities near here? Naruto said. Look to your left. There's a large city there. It has more people than the whole land of fire combined. Or, Karama said after feeling out for a while. Let's go there. It's close to the ocean. Isabu interrupted. Or, Karama continued, completely ignoring Isabu. You could look to your right and go there. It's significantly closer and smaller. Naruto looked at both directions, thinking of what to do. After some time, he finally created a plan of attack. He reached for the chakra suppression tag on his neck that burned out due to the use of hiration. 
he placed it in one of the storage seals tattooed on his arm. He then created a shadow clone and handed over a Horatian kanai and a sealing tag to it. Go to the city to the left. Find some out-of-the-way area in the city and hide the kanai. Use the tag to siphon of chakra from me. Create a thousand shadow clones and collect information there. I'll come over later. Yes, boss. The clone saluted and ran to execute his orders. And don't forget to use Henge. Naruto shouted over to the clone. Are you sure that's a great idea? Kurama asked. Eh. What's the worst that could happen? Don't jinx us, Kit. He picked up the kanai on the ground and placed it again in his storage seal. He then ran to the opposite direction of his clone as fast as he can. Edwards Air Force Base, California. March 28, 2005, 1735 H. Local. Edwards Air Force Base is an Air Force installation built in 1933, approximately 35 kilometers NE of Los Angeles. Throughout the years, it served as one of the military bases used to defend the American Western seaboard. With the advancement of space exploration and military technology, the Edwards AFB is one of the military bases, which has a close working relationship with National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, due to its close proximity with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, due to its close proximity with Stark Industries, which is one of their partners. Because of the working relationships with these government agencies, several experimental and advanced technologies are housed or controlled in this space. Of the dozens of technology being tested, two things would detect one of the first signs of Naruto. The first is an experimental detection system invented by Stark Industries. Laser Diffusion Detection Relay, or simply called LADDER, is an advanced detection and mapping system that can be used to accurately guide short-range missiles or help small-scale logistical planning. It uses a short series of prisms and satellite relays to diffuse high- and low-energy lasers to create a real-time 3D rendition of the environment up to 250 kilometers away. It won't penetrate inside buildings or houses, but it can be used to see people and cars in motion in a surprising amount of detail. Currently, it can't detect colors due to the limited amount of detail the lasers can detect. Detect. The amount of data processed by the system would require a supercomputer to process about 200 gigabytes of data a second, which the technology at that time could barely achieve. The second is a group of satellites working in unison to produce high-quality real-time surveillance video or picture. It is called GODS's, God's Eyes, or Geo-Orbital Diametric Synchronization Identification and Surveillance. Developed by DARPA with the help of NASA, this was designed to capture surveillance photos of high-value targets for future operations. A total of eight probe satellites and one primary satellite are positioned in a way that all satellites are in geosynchronous orbit within the same plane while maintaining as far a distance with each other as possible. The primary satellite would always be placed in the center of an octagonal plane made by the probe satellites. Each probe satellite is equipped with a high-quality reflection telescope with each centimeter of the mirror capable of minute adjustments to offset the atmosphere's refraction of light. The primary satellite would be the central relay of all the probe satellites and would always be directly overhead the target area. The photo or video produced is a compilation of nine different camera angles of the same area taken at the same time. This would help the computer create a high-quality high-quality 3D model of the area. The quality of the photo or video developed is comparable to shots taken only 5 meters away. The maximum area of capture is 100 kilometers diameter, with quality decreasing the further the target is from the center. Technical Sergeant Jonah Hernandez is relaxing in front of his workstation, waiting for dinner. He enlisted for the Air Force to achieve his dream of flying around the world, while still serving his country as his father, Captain Joaquin Hernandez of the Army. Well, he is currently not flying anything, 
but some paper airplanes in his barracks now and again. But at least he gets to play with the cool new toys developed by the military, since he is one of the smarter persons in the base. He is currently the test handler of the ladder system. He sometimes just spies on some random people going about their lives, but now, something more serious has been picked up by the system. Ha, huh, that can't be right. Hernandez said to himself, while looking at the notification on his screen. It is showing that an approximately 25 centimeters long object traveled at supersonic speeds and crash landed near the edge of the visible zone. Hey Collins, can you take a look at this for me? Hernandez called Technical Sergeant Elizabeth Collins. The technical operator of the God's IS system. Walking over to Hernandez's station, he hunched over and looked over the data in the monitor. Turning over the rendered map a couple of times and playing back the replay a couple of times, she finally said. What the hell is that? Is that a rocket? No, too small. It's showing it crashed from somewhere east. I know, I'm looking at it too. Don't give me attitude. You're the one who called me here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. But can you use the eye to look at what happened? I know it's over Vegas near the crash site. Apology accepted. Give me a second. Walking back to her station, she opened the latest data packet she received from the satellite. Scrolling the time bar to the target time and closing upon the area, she watched what, what happened. Hernandez, you are going to want to call the general after seeing this. Collins finally said. Hernandez walked over and saw the video playing on the screen. Fuck. What the hell was that? Where the hell did he come from? Hernandez reacted. In the video, a three-pronged knife crashed in the desert. Two seconds after that, a man wearing a jacket appeared on top of the knife. He looked disoriented for a moment. He looked around while talking to someone. He then multiplied out of thin air and handed over another of those weird knives and a piece of paper. The doppelganger then ran at least 250 kilometers per hour towards L.A. until he was out of satellite range. The original then picked up the knife and ran towards Las Vegas at similar speeds. I'm going to create a copy of this. You create a copy of the report you've got from the ladder. Collins finally said after Hernandez is done freaking out. For what? Hernandez replied, still a little on edge. We are going to report this to the general. Move it, come on. We need to catch him before he leaves. Hernandez nodded in agreement with Collins's suggestion. The two quickly made copies of everything and compiled them in a folder. They both locked their stations and ran towards the door. They left the experimental relay room and biometrically locked it to make sure that the room can't be tampered with. Hernandez looked at the guard posted outside the room and ordered. Whatever happens, don't let anyone in. We need to bring something to the general. The guard saluted to confirm he received the order. The two then jogged quickly to the administration building and saw the general just walking over to his service car. They ran over to him and saluted. T Technical Sergeant Collins and Hernandez, sir. We are operators for some experimental projects, sir. We have observed some irregularities that need to be brought to your attention, sir. Collins said while extending her hand to pass the folder. They looked nervously to the man at the imposing man before them. Brigadier General Colin the Titan Powell is a six feet one inch African American's man renowned for his no nonsense attitude and his support for injured vets. He has short black hair and wears wire rim glasses. He earned his nickname during the first Gulf War when he was just a captain. He was leading a 15-man unit of Air Force Special Operations Command Task to take out the land-to-land -land missiles obtained by Saddam Hussein. The mission was continuing smoothly until it all went fubar during their retreat. 
Three members died, while the rest of them received various injuries. Only General Collins was lightly injured since he was calling for the extract chopper. He almost single-handedly fought off waves of enemy combatants and defended his unit. He then carried all his unit members, even the dead ones, to the extraction point. Ten members survived the op. He was then called the Titan since he carried all of his units, just like the Titan Atlas. The general stared at the two for a moment, before he extended his hand to take the folder. After a few seconds looking over the folder, the general leaned over and knocked on the car window. It rolled down, and the general said with a low voice, Circle back to the parking. I'll call you in 30 minutes if I need to be picked up. Yes, sir. The driver said and drove off. Looking over to the two sergeants, the general said, Follow me. The general turned around and walked back inside the building. Sloan, Nevada, 2005. Slow down kit. We are getting close. We don't want to tip our hand too early. Karama said. Okay. Naruto replied. Hey, there's some road over there. He started when he saw a clearing on the horizon. He walked towards the road to make sure he doesn't attract any unwanted attention. After 20 minutes of walking, he finally reached the road. Whoa, wherever we are, this country sure is rich. Who makes road out of concrete and in the middle of nowhere? Naruto mused. He then looked over the sign by the side of the street. He stared at it for some time and hanged his head low. I can't read it. Naruto said sadly. Of course you can't read it. We're in another world. We probably won't be able to understand them either. Karama replied. The Bijus are hundreds of years old. A byproduct of living that long is being able to learn a whole bunch of languages. Hmm. I think I can make a temporary fix for the speaking thing. Hold on a minute. He then walked over a rock and sat down. He unsealed some ink and paper and drew some intricate design. When he's done, he placed the sealing tag on his nape and activated it. That should cover it for a while. I'll be going to be able to understand them, and when I'm speaking, the tag will convert my words to something they can understand. It even applies a small jinjutsu to allow the person to see the corresponding mouth motion for what they would understand. Awesome, right? Naruto explained proudly. Good job. Take a cookie. Karama replied, oozing with sarcasm. Naruto pouted because of Karama's reply. We need to reach the city before nightfall. You are going to continue walking. Gyuki said. Roger. After another thirty minutes of walking, a carriage without a horse stopped next to him and made that god-awful sound. He stopped and looked at a sleek-looking carriage, awed by its design. The window opened, and an angelic voice asked. You need a ride? Chapter 1, Prologue, In a New World Author's Note, This is my first fanfiction story. Any criticisms and suggestions are appreciated. Giangu, Sealmaster, Rina Tensei Sharingan Naritox Harem Extremely AU for Naruto and slightly AU for Avengers. The Ruins of Yuzushiogakure Well, I guess this is it, huh? Naruto said with a sad voice. We know it's gonna happen someday. It's just a matter of when. Karama said. Standing in the ruins of the home of his ancestors. Naruto stood in front of gate with its doors covered in writing. He wore a dark orange jacket over a black long sleeve shirt. He also wore a modified black umbu pants with multiple pockets and a pair of brown boots. His long bright blonde hair is covered by the hood of his jacket. After the defeat of Kagaya Atsutsuki, 
a short period of peace has been observed in the elemental nations. Countries and hidden villages alike are working hand in hand to recover from the disasters caused by the Fourth Great Shinobi War. But of course, it wouldn't last long. Everybody knew it. It only takes a single spark of human greed and hates to reverse all the progress achieved. Nobody knew better how fickle human nature is than Naruto Uzumaki Namakes. The last heir of the Senju and Uzumaki clans from his mother's side, Kushina Uzumaki, and the last heir of the Namakes clan and member of the Uchiha clan from his father's side, the Yandame Hokage Minato Namakes. As a kid, Naruto has always been the target of hate by the citizens of Konoha due to his unique circumstances. He was chosen as the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi by his own father after it escaped from its previous vessel, his mother. Naruto was raised ignorant from his own heritage by the order of the Sandame Hokage, Hiruzen Sarutobi. Naruto became the target of scorn, scorn and hatred of the ignorant masses due to him being the prison of the Kyubi. Only recently has this outlook been changed due to his role in the Fourth Shinobi War and the defeat of Kagaya Atsutsuki. Tired of the cycle of hatred, Naruto trained hard to overcome the challenges that the path to peace would face. He became the foremost master of Fuinjutsu, acquired the ultimate Dojutsu Rina Tensei Sharingan, or simply called Shinigan, became the first full sage, and acquired the Takigakure's famed Kenjutsu, the Jiangu all after the war. He also set out to allow himself to become the Jinchuriki of the Nine Bishu. Shikaku, Matatabi, Isabu, Sun Goku, Kokuo, Saiken, Komiai, Yuki, and Karama. This would ensure that the power of the Bijou wouldn't be abused by any hidden village, and would allow some form of freedom to the Bijou due to his modified Death God Seal that allows partial autonomy of the Bijou inside the seal. An unforeseen side effect of all the power he acquired was that he became essentially immortal. An overreaction to his predicament, he decided to leave the world he has known and live a relatively normal life in another world. He dedicated his knowledge of Fuinjutsu and near limitless amount of chakra in his disposal, be created a bridge to another world. Packing up everything he would need and saying one last goodbye to the only world he has known, the 21 year old Naruto, the hero of the elemental nations, left the world in a flash of light so bright it rivaled the sun, without so much as a goodbye to his friends and families. Central Park, New York, USA, 2005 That is the worst duration ever. Naruto shouted with a fervor. Shut up. If it's bad for you, how about for us in here? Chomei replied with equal enthusiasm. I guess it's a success since we're not dead Gyuki added with mirth. Kit, we need to get out of here. We may have attracted some unwanted attention with our exit Karama advised. Yeah yeah. I'm going. Shish Naruto said. Applying suppression seals on his nape to cover his chakra signature, he left the scene in as much speed and stealth he could muster without chakra enhancements. Hiding in the shadows of the trees around him, he noticed there are paths and structures in the forest. On second thought, it's not a forest but a large park. Who the hell makes a park the size of Kanoha? Naruto thought to himself. It took ten seconds for him to reach the clearing of the park. Still hiding from the shadows, Naruto took notice of the world he landed on. What he saw awed and surprised him. Buildings higher than the Hokage Monument everywhere, carriages running without horses or ox, bright lights that reach for the sky and people, lots and lots of people. All were looking towards where he came from. Holy shit Isabu drawled out. Imagine climbing one of those. Son Goku blurted out. You're really just big monkey, aren't you? Kokuo teased. We need a base of operations while we figure out how this world works. Saiken said. Yeah. Let me try something. I feel we are still not far enough from where we came. Naruto said. Getting Horatian Kanai from his pocket, 
he threw it hard at a 45-degree angle to maximize distance and to miss any buildings in its immediate path. When he felt the kanai stopped, he asked Karama, any people near where that kanai landed? None from what I can tell. Karama replied. Okay, here goes nothing. With a flash of light, he's gone. Chapter 2, Blinding Light Author's Note Hi, I'm back. Leave a review to make this fanfic better. The Triskelion, Washington, D.C. March 28, 2005, 2115 H. Local An unassuming man is moving quickly down the corridor to report to his boss. Tension can clearly be seen even if he is feigning a comic exterior. Everyone can see it, causing them to move aside to let him through. He's a Caucasian wearing tailored suit and black leather shoes. He has dark brown hair and a receding hairline. He is Agent Phil Coulson. The right-hand man of the Director of the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, or SHIELD. An expert in information gathering, stealth, and diplomacy, he has already seen more things than people would believe, and can keep his calm through even some of the most chaotic of scenarios. He is generally considered an easygoing individual, with a great sense of humor. To find him reacting this way would mean an entirely unprecedented event occurred. Reaching his destination, he knocked twice and entered the office. He saw his boss pacing back and forth behind his desk while talking on the phone. Yes, Mr. President. We already have a quick response team on site, with a secondary team en route. Yes. Yes, sir, we'll send an update when able. Goodbye, sir. Facing Coulson is an intimidating bald African-American man. He is wearing an all-black combat attire covered by a black leather trench coat. Another notable characteristic is a black eye patch covering his left eye covering a large scar running across it. What the hell happened, Coulson? I had to find out in 083 event from POTUS. Good thing we had people close by who at least had the brains to check it out and take control of the situation. Now I'm going to ask with all the calm that I can muster. What the fuck is going on? The man known as Nick Fury asked, finally ending his tirade. Nicholas Fury, or simply known as Nick Fury, is the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. S.H.I.E.L.D. is formed to protect the world from things they are not ready to know, and at its head is the quintessential spy. If one thinks of spies, he is what usually forms in your head. He's an expert, expert on deep infiltration, espionage, and assassination. He had toppled governments, assassinated world leaders. Basically, he changed the world. There isn't much known about him, and that's the way he likes it. Handing over a tablet that contains the information on the event, Coulson answered the tirade like a professional. On 2,030 hours, an energy surge was recorded on the north side of Central Park. Our sensors didn't record the event since the energy surge is what would be considered harmless. The event just released the energy as purely visible light, which is really strange. Accidental recording of the event, which is already circling social media, showed that the light emitted exceeds the brightness of the sun. A large number of people who were accidentally looking at the direction, as it happened, are already checking into hospitals due to visual issues. The teams on site are already cordoning off the area with the help of local law enforcement. Our New York branch techs are just three minutes away. While looking at the tablet, Fury is formulating a plan of attack and running multiple scenarios in his head. With a plan formed, he ordered Coulson. I want you on a flight to New York with our tech with all the toys you can bring. Take another ten agents for investigation and bring Barton with you. He can see things others don't. A commercial or private? Coulson asked. A hardened stare is an answer he received. Right, the Quinjet it is. I'll just get going then, sir. 
I'll send Romanoff as your relief team as soon as she gets back from California. Carlson nodded and walked out of the office, readying himself for another mission. The Triskelion, Washington, D.C. March 28, 2005, 2145 H. Local. Agent Clint Barton is in a meeting room waiting to be briefed about an urgent mission he just been informed about. He is already on his way to the dormitories after his daily workout and conditioning when he has been called back through his phone. He really would like to complain about his working hours if only he had one. Being a high-level shield agent meant that he had irregular hours and can be called at any time. He already changed into his standard sleeveless shield combat uniform. His trusty weapon in a carry case beneath the table. Some would describe Agent Barton serious guy on a mission, but easygoing and relatable off of it. He is also considered a special kind of prodigy. He has a recorded eyesight of 25, near perfect recall, and an outstanding eye to hand coordination. A master marksman in most conventional weaponry by 18, and a gifted infiltrator specializing in assassination and bodyguard missions. What makes people consider him a little weird is his choice of weaponry, which is the bow and arrow. Shield Tech has upgraded his choice of weapon to allow him to deal with many situations with just a change of the arrow tip that can be remotely changed. Looking around the room, he counted 20 people in the room, excluding himself. Based on his observations, ten of them are definitely field agents, and the other ten are techs. Ha, huh, this looks like big op with this many. Field agents, but why in the hell do we need this many techs? Barton thought to himself. Technicians or techs are their scientists. They usually stay in the labs, but certain circumstances may need them. He tapped the shoulder of the field agent in front of him and asked. Got any idea what all this is about? Um, no, sir. I have just been called from leave. I haven't even started yet. Uh, sir. The agent answered in a nervous tone when he recognized who was asking him. Not receiving any information, he spied a tech looking in his phone. He walked over to the tech at the other side of the room, Barton asked. You have any news about the op? I may have some idea, Agent Barton. The tech answered. All the people in the room are now focused on the conversation. Well? Agent Barton urged the tech to continue. Ah, yes. Browsing at his phone. At approximately 8.30 this evening, a bright flashlight was observed at Central Park showing the video playing on his phone to the audience in the room. Since our sensors didn't record any spike either in infrared, UV, radiation, or otherwise, the only explanation left is that the event is just like a large flashlight only just a few stops brighter than the sun. We are currently unable to form any hypothesis about the event. Well, that's basically the gist of what I'm gonna say. A new voice was heard from the doorway. Everybody swung their heads to who it is. Hey, Phil. You're the one who called us in? Barton asked. Carlson walked over to the podium and said, no. Orders came from Fury himself with urging from the president. Wow. So this is a big deal, huh? When are we going to go? In half an hour. I want everyone to pack for at least a week. Bring all the sensors, machines, or doodads that you may need, and you might think unavailable at the New York field office. We're going to take a Quinjet to our hotel and start tomorrow morning. Carlson ordered. You heard him, let's go. Barton urged the people in the room when no one stood up. The people in the room started to file out quickly to prepare for travel. How bad is it? Barton asked Carlson with a touch of worry in his voice. Not as bad as you might think. Carlson significantly calmed down from his earlier state. It is considered an 083 event. 
It just caused minor panic to the populace. You know New York, if it doesn't affect them, they don't care. The president is just concerned since he's going to run for re-election, and New York is one of his big bases. What concerns Fury, on the other hand, is what we should worry about. We have no idea what caused the event. Zilch, zero, nada. Remember what the tech said about the censors? Yeah. What's so special about it? Nothing was recorded about the event. No spikes in the infrared, UV, or radiation. That just doesn't happen. No phenomenon artificial or natural can form this amount of visible light without some byproduct. Even a flashlight produces heat. Carlson explained. So what is your take on this? Cause my money's on aliens. Barton offered his opinion. Maybe, but I doubt it. My gut says it's going to big. Well, shit. How many times is your gut wrong? Not much. Well, I hope you're wrong. They separate from each other at the corridor's intersection, with a sense of foreboding on what is to come. Chapter 3, Not Stealthy Enough Mojave Desert, California, 2005 A man suddenly in the middle of the desert. God damn it, Karama. Why didn't you tell me it landed that fucking far? I really hate those long-range hurations. Naruto complained. Well, you didn't ask. At least it's not as bad as that Horatian gate you made. That's just a doozy. Karama replied. Ugh. I really like this place. Can we stay here, please? Shikaku said with extreme enthusiasm. No way, only you can love this place, Sand Brain. Isaba countered. Ha! What did you just say? All right. Shut up. Gyuki roared at the two. Naruto looked around and observed where he landed. It looked like he landed in the middle of a desert. The sun is just setting, leaving a beautiful image to behold. There are no structures anywhere in sight, only some mountain ranges on the horizon. He looked down on his feet and saw a small crater only half a foot in diameter. At the center, his Horatian Kanai. Thanks, Yuki. We're not going to stay here, Isabu. There's almost nothing here. It might be perfect for a base if we're hiding but we need information. Karama, can you figure out where are the largest cities near here? Naruto said. Look to your left. There's a large city there. It has more people than the whole land of fire combined or... Karama said after feeling out for a while. Let's go there. It's close to the ocean. Isabu interrupted. Or... Karama continued completely ignoring Isabu. You could look to your right and go there. It's significantly closer and smaller. Naruto looked at both directions, thinking of what to do. After some time, he finally created a plan of attack. He reached for the chakra suppression tag on his neck that burnt out due to the use of Horatian. He placed it in one of the storage seals tattooed on his arm. He then created a shadow clone and handed over a Horatian Kanai and a ceiling tag to it. Go to the city to the left. Find some out-of-the-way area in the city and hide the Kanai. Use the tag to siphon of chakra from me. Create a thousand shadow clones and collect information there. I'll come over later. Yes, boss. The clone saluted and ran to execute his orders. And don't forget to use Henge. Naruto shouted over to the clone. Are you sure that's a great idea? Karama asked. Eh. What's the worst that could happen? Don't jinx us, Kit. 
He picked up the kanai on the ground and placed it again in his storage seal. He then ran to the opposite direction of his clone as fast as he can. Edwards Air Force Base, California March 28, 2005, 1735 H. Local Edwards Air Force Base is an Air Force installation built in 1933, approximately 35 kilometers NE of Los Angeles. Throughout the years, it served as one of the military bases used to defend the American Western seaboard. With the advancement of space exploration and military technology, the Edwards AFB is one of the military bases, which has a close working relationship with National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, due to its close proximity with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, due to its close proximity with Stark Industries, which is one of their partners. Because of the working relationships with these government agencies, several experimental and advanced technologies are housed or controlled in this space. Of the dozens of technology being tested, two things would detect one of the first signs of Naruto. The first is an experimental detection system invented by Stark Industries. Laser Diffusion Detection Relay, or simply called Ladder, is an advanced detection and mapping system that can be used to accurately guide short-range missiles or help small-scale logistical planning. It uses a short series of prisms and satellite relays to diffuse high- and low-energy lasers to create a real-time 3D rendition of the environment up to 250 kilometers away. It won't penetrate inside buildings or houses, but it can be used to see people and cars in motion in a surprising amount of detail. Currently, it can't detect colors due to the limited amount of detail the lasers can detect. Detect. The amount of data processed by the system would require a supercomputer to process about 200 gigabytes of data a second, which the technology at that time could barely achieve. The second is a group of satellites working in unison to produce high-quality real-time surveillance video or picture. It is called GODS's, God's Eyes, or Geo-Orbital Diametric Synchronization Identification and Surveillance. Developed by DARPA with the help of NASA, this was designed to capture surveillance photos of high-value targets for future operations. A total of eight probe satellites and one primary satellite are positioned in a way that all satellites are in geosynchronous orbit within the same plane while maintaining as far a distance with each other as possible. The primary satellite would always be placed in the center of an octagonal plane made by the probe satellites. Each probe satellite is equipped with a high-quality reflection telescope with each centimeter of the mirror capable of minute adjustments to offset the atmosphere's refraction of light. The primary satellite would be the central relay of all the probe satellites and would always be directly overhead the target area. The photo or video produced is a compilation of nine different camera angles of the same area taken at the same time. This would help the computer create a high-quality high-quality 3D model of the area. The quality of the photo or video developed is comparable to shots taken only 5 meters away. The maximum area of capture is 100 kilometers diameter, with quality decreasing the further the target is from the center. Technical Sergeant Jonah Hernandez is relaxing in front of his workstation, waiting for dinner. He enlisted for the Air Force to achieve his dream of flying around the world, while still serving his country as his father, Captain Joaquin Hernandez of the Army. Well, he is currently not flying anything but some paper airplanes in his barracks now and again. But at least he gets to play with the cool new toys developed by the military, since he is one of the smarter persons in the base. He is currently the test handler of the ladder system. He sometimes just spies on some random people going about their lives, but now, Something more serious has been picked up by the system. Ha, huh, that can't be right. Hernandez said to himself, while looking at the notification on his screen. It is showing that an approximately 25 centimeters long object traveled at supersonic speeds and crash-landed near the edge of the visible zone. Hey Collins, can you take a look at this for me? Hernandez called Technical Sergeant Elizabeth Collins. The technical operator of the God's IS system. System.
Walking over to Hernandez's station, he hunched over and looked over the data in the monitor. Turning over the rendered map a couple of times and playing back the replay a couple of times, she finally said, What the hell is that? Is that a rocket? No, too small. It's showing it crashed from somewhere east. I know, I'm looking at it too. Don't give me attitude. You're the one who called me here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. But can you use the eye to look at what happened? I know it's over Vegas near the crash site. Apology accepted. Give me a second. Walking back to her station, she opened the latest data packet she received from the satellite. Scrolling the time bar to the target time and closing upon the area, she watched what happened. Hernandez, you are going to want to call the general after seeing this. Collins finally said. Hernandez walked over and saw the video playing on the screen. Fuck. What the hell was that? Where the hell did he come from? Hernandez reacted. In the video, a three-pronged knife crashed in the desert. Two seconds after that, a man wearing a jacket appeared on top of the knife. He looked disoriented for a moment. He looked around while talking to someone. He then multiplied out of thin air and handed over another of those weird knives and a piece of paper. The doppelganger then ran at least 250 kilometers per hour towards L.A. until he was out of satellite range. The original then picked up the knife and ran towards Las Vegas at similar speeds. I'm going to create a copy of this. You create a copy of the report you've got from the latter. Collins finally said after Hernandez is done freaking out. For what? Hernandez replied, still a little on edge. We are going to report this to the general. Move it, come on. We need to catch him before he leaves. Hernandez nodded in agreement with Collins's suggestion. The two quickly made copies of everything and compiled them in a folder. They both locked their stations and ran towards the door. They left the experimental relay room and biometrically locked it to make sure that the room can't be tampered with. Hernandez looked at the guard posted outside the room and ordered. Whatever happens, don't let anyone in. We need to bring something to the general. The guard saluted to confirm he received the order. The two then jogged quickly to the administration building and saw the general just walking over to his service car. They ran over to him and saluted. Technical Sergeant Collins and Hernandez, sir. We are operators for some experimental projects, sir. We have observed some irregularities that need to be brought to your attention, sir. Collins said while extending her hand to pass the folder. They looked nervously to the man at the imposing man before them. Brigadier General Colin the Titan Powell is a six feet one inch African American's man renowned for his no-nonsense attitude and his support for injured vets. He has short black hair and wears wire rim glasses. He earned his nickname during the first Gulf War when he was just a captain. He was leading a 15-man unit of Air Force Special Operations Command Task to take out the land-to-land -land missiles obtained by Saddam Hussein. The mission was continuing smoothly until it all went fubar during their retreat. Three members died while the rest of them received various injuries. Only General Collins was lightly injured since he was calling for the extract chopper. He almost single-handedly fought off waves of enemy combatants and defended his unit. He then carried all his unit members, even the dead ones, to the extraction point. Ten members survived the op. He was then called the Titan since he carried all of his units, just like the Titan Atlas. The general stared at the two for a moment, before he extended his hand to take the folder. After a few seconds looking over the folder, the general leaned over and knocked on the car window. It rolled down and the general said with a low voice, Circle back to the parking. I'll call you in 30 minutes if I need to be picked up.
Yes, sir. The driver said and drove off. Looking over to the two sergeants, the general said. Follow me. The general turned around and walked back inside the building. Sloan, Nevada, 2005. Slow down kit. We are getting close. We don't want to tip our hand too early. Karama said. Okay. Naruto replied. Hey, there's some road over there. He started when he saw a clearing on the horizon. He walked towards the road to make sure he doesn't attract any unwanted attention. After 20 minutes of walking, he finally reached the road. Whoa, wherever we are, this country sure is rich. Who makes road out of concrete and in the middle of nowhere? Naruto mused. He then looked over the sign by the side of the street. He stared at it for some time and hanged his head low. I can't read it. Naruto said sadly. Of course you can't read it. We're in another world. We probably won't be able to understand them either. Karama replied. The Bijus are hundreds of years old. A byproduct of living that long is being able to learn a whole bunch of languages. Hmm. I think I can make a temporary fix for the speaking thing. Hold on a minute. He then walked over a rock and sat down. He unsealed some ink and paper and drew some intricate design. When he's done, he placed the sealing tag on his nape and activated it. That should cover it for a while. I'll be going to be able to understand them, and when I'm speaking, the tag will convert my words to something they can understand. It even applies a small jinjutsu to allow the person to see the corresponding mouth motion for what they would understand. Awesome, right? Naruto explained proudly. Good job. Take a cookie. Karama replied, oozing with sarcasm. Naruto pouted because of Karama's reply. We need to reach the city before nightfall. You are going to continue walking. Gyuki said. Roger. After another thirty minutes of walking, a carriage without a horse stopped next to him and made that god-awful sound. He stopped and looked at a sleek-looking carriage, awed by its design. The window opened and an angelic voice asked. You need a ride? Chapter 4, First Contact Las Vegas, Nevada March 28, 2005, 1900H Local The Black Widow One of the boogeymen of the world's politicians and elites. There are no missions she couldn't handle. No person she couldn't assassinate, no information she couldn't extract. No mission she wouldn't do for the right price. Originally named Natalia Romanova, she's a 5 feet 7 inches Russian woman with a face and body to die for. She has red hair and green eyes. Considered the best of the best of Russia's Red Room Black Widow program, a brutal training to create the perfect spies for Russia to use. Graduated in the program in 1999 at the young age of 14, she worked exclusively for Russia's intelligence agency, KGB, until she left and gone AWOL in 2001. She made a name for herself doing work for the highest bidder and having an almost perfect record until S.H.I.E.L.D. took an interest in her a year later. S.H.I.E.L.D. sent their best agent to kill or capture the Black Widow. They sent Agent Clint Barton or Hawkeye. S.H.I.E.L.D. was interested in the possible information the Black Widow may have on one of their high-value targets taken from one of her hits. Barton finally cornered her in Minsk after almost a month of cat and mouse chase. When Barton saw her, he recognized something familiar in her eyes. While holding her at arrow point, he asked. You got a lot of red on your ledger. Want some help cleaning it up? That's what sealed the deal for the infamous Black Widow. She surrendered to S.H.I.E.L.D. and offered to work for them in exchange for immunity. 
She went for six months of intensive accelerated course for S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and passed with flying colors. Fury considered her as one of the best st steals he got. Barton became her go-to partner due to the close working and personal relationship they developed in the past two years. She currently only takes her orders from Director Fury himself. She is currently on her way to Las Vegas to relax and unwind. It's one of the perks for being placed so high up in the food chain. You can get vacation time for every top priority mission, although she doesn't do this often. Her latest mission is taking care of a Chinese spy working as an engineer in Stark Industries. The whole mission was a textbook operation, except for the high-profile position of the spy inside the company. His sudden disappearance would cause some reaction from the company. She's driving down I-15 in her advance release, and S.H.I.E.L.D. upgraded Koenigsegg CCX when she saw a man walking just past Jean Sport Aviation Center. She usually would just drive past the guy, but all her instincts are telling her to pull over. She slowed down to a stop beside the guy, rolled down the passenger side window, honked her horn and asked. You need a ride? She observed the man as young as herself. Standing at six feet two inches with a solid build, he wore a dark orange zip-up hoodie, black shirt, and cargo pants. She saw his piercing cerulean eyes, medium-length golden blonde hair with two longer strands framing his face, and finally, what might look like his whiskers by his cheek adding a wild vibe to his whole persona. He's looking awestruck at her car. It's still a little flattering to see someone appreciate a top-of-the-line peak of human engineering. When the man heard her question, he looked a little surprised and looked at her. He thought for a second and said, Are you talking to me? Yes, I'm talking to you. There's nobody else here, right? She answered in a playful tone. The man scratched the back of his head in embarrassment. He he he, sorry. Sure I would like a ride if you wouldn't mind. Come on, hop on in. Natasha automatically opened the door. When, when the man settled in the chair, the door automatically closed, and she drove off. Thanks for the ride. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, by the way. The man, now known as Naruto, introduced himself. No problem. I'm Natalie Rockford. Natasha said in response using one of her aliases. The spy business is a pretty unpredictable profession. Even the smallest of slip-ups can lead to death. It's better to be safe than sorry. Looking over the guy discreetly, she's looking for any sign of deception on his part. You don't get this good being a spy without being able to find out if someone is lying or not. Your parents must really like whirlpools, Natasha said conversationally. Due to her profession, she's fluent in over 20 languages, and one of them is Japanese. Ha ha ha. I guess. I never really thought about it like that. Naruto said awkwardly. Trying to change the subject, he asked, where are you going, by the way? Vegas. Trying to see my luck on the slots. How about you? Natasha asked. She's still trying to pick up some information from him. I notice your lack of luggage, or even a bag. She added. Yeah, about that. I kind of lost it, including all of my cash. I am hoping to win at least a little bit to carry on. Naruto laid out his plan. When she saw the skeptical look on her, he continued. Bad plan? Yes. Stupid plan? Well, I don't know about that. I've always considered myself a little lucky. I mean, look at me, a beautiful woman just picked me up in an awesome car. I thought it only happens in movies. He said the last part in a sincere tone. Ha ha ha. Laying it a little thick there aren't you, whiskers. But I gotta say you're not the only guy who went to Vegas to try their luck but you're the only guy who walked all the way to Vegas to play. 
Natasha said, genuinely amused. I have no problems walking, but I kinda liked this. Traveling in style. Naruto replied, brushing over his new nickname. Naruto then proceeded to look all over inside the car. He paid particular attention to the dash where the clock is. After the perusal of the interior, he asked. So, what do you do for a living? I work for Stark Industries as a public relations manager. I just got off this afternoon. You? Natasha answered, immediately using her cover story. I'm between jobs since I just moved here. I want to leave it all behind. I was a freelance contractor. Doing odd jobs here and there. Nothing special, really. Naruto said, telling a half lie. Being a shinobi really meant being a freelance contractor that can be hired by almost anyone to do almost everything, even as mundane as painting a fence. That answer set of alarms in her mind, but the only outward change visible is the subtle narrowing of her eyes. She used that excuse too many times before to not recognize it. He's not a spy, or at least not an experienced one. No self-respecting would get caught unaware like this. So maybe an assassin? Or maybe an ex-military? I got too little information to know. She thought to herself. MGM Grand Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada. March 28, 2005, 1715 Local. It looks like we're here. What's your plan? Natasha asked while stepping off the car and walking to the back to pick up her luggage. Naruto followed her to the back of the vehicle. I don't really know. I might walk around for a while and maybe get lucky and find a chip or cash on the ground. Happened to me before. She took the bag from her trunk and closed it. She then walked over to the valet and then proceeded to move towards the hotel's front of the entrance. Well, good luck to you. I hope we get to see each other again. Same here. Thanks again for the ride. Naruto said and finally walking to away. Natasha then walked to the front desk to book a room. She immediately got one, and after signing in her information, she headed to her room. After checking into a hotel room and sweeping for bugs, a habit she picked up from her work, she took her phone from her bag and turned on its encryption feature. She then called Fury. Hello, Romanov. How's your vacation? Fury greeted in a gruff voice. All is well, boss. I'm in Vegas right now, going to play some craps for a week. Natasha said. But that's not why I called. I need someone checked through the system. Okay. What's the name, and why should I run him or her? Fury asked with a touch of curiosity. Natasha's phone has access to its database. The only explanation she would let him run the check is if there is something about the person he needs to know about. Him. The name's Naruto Uzumaki. Six feet four inches, blonde hair, blue eyes, possibly Japanese ancestry due to his name. Natasha described. Picked him up near Sloan on my way to Vegas, walking by the side of the road. Oh, by the way, he has whiskers. She continued. On the other side of the line, Fury is inputting the details on his computer when he suddenly paused and said. Excuse me? Whiskers? Yes, whiskers. Natasha said in a deadpan tone. Don't tell me you're making me search for him because of whiskers. Fury said in a tone of disbelief. Come off it, boss. I'm asking you to run him since he's walking by the side of the road with nothing but the clothes on his back. Didn't even look a little sweaty or fatigued, considering where I found him, he must have been walking for hours. So, maybe he's from the military? No, too young, he looked like my age. 
late teens, early twenties. He also said he was a freelance contractor who just moved to the U.S. to leave it all behind. That's what caused me to be wary of him. That should be easier. If he moved here, he should have a record somewhere. Fury was saying when he heard the computer ping. On the screen, it says no match found. Romanov, there's no match anywhere in the system. Maybe he used an alias. Fuck. Natasha said under her breath. I'll send over my car's interior camera feed, can you match the face? I just got feeling about him. Natasha said, hoping to find something about the guy. I'll see what would come up. You're really hung up on him, huh? Fury said with a teasing tone. Oh, and by the way, don't fly to D.C. Head straight to New York. Your team would meet you there. Team? I rarely operate with a team, especially on local soil. It's not that kind of op. You'll lead the relief team sent to New York to investigate an 083 event that happened in Central Park. POTUS is writing my ass about it since it happened. I'll send you the details. Roger. Don't cut your vacation. Carlson and Barton are on site. Relax for now. Thanks, boss. Good night. Romanov said then hanged up the phone. She remotely downloaded the video from her car then sent it to Fury. Who the hell are you? Natasha mused to herself, and then she went to bed. Las Vegas, Nevada. March 28, 2005, 1730H local. Achoo. Ua. Somebody's thinking about you. Maybe it's the nice girl you met. Chome teased. Don't get started again on that Chome, and next time don't start shouting and interjecting the whole time when I'm talking to someone. Confuses the hell out of me. Naruto complained. Sorry. But you got to admit she's one beautiful woman. Well, at least for a human. I won't dignify that with a response. Naruto answered with a grin, remembering the woman who helped him. It looks like he picked up some things from his godfather. You know she's lying, right? Karama asked. Oh yeah, big time. The only truth she said is that she was going to relax here. So what are we gonna do? Gyuki asked. Naruto looked around while walking down the sidewalk. Looking left and right, up and down, he took in his surroundings. Huge buildings in all shapes and sizes. Bright lights everywhere. People. Lots of them. He guessed it's normal in this world's cities. It's like Tanzakagai multiplied by 100 and placed in Suna. What really catches his eyes are the women. Scantily clad, exotic, and beautiful. Arosensei would definitely feel like he died and went to heaven. We need cash. Any ideas on how to get it? We can pick the pocket of someone. Kokuo said. Underground fight. I saw some posters of fights. If there are legitimate ones, there sure are to be underground ones. Sun Goku added with excitement. Or you can turn back and play at the casino, see if Lady Luck loved you so much she followed you across universes. Karama suggested. All good points, but we need money for the last two. Underground fights would need an entry fee, and casinos like the one we came from have high buy-in. We're going to do all three in that order to get big money. Naruto decided. He walked down a secluded alleyway, looked around to check for people, and made twenty shadow clones, all hinged in disguises. You guys spread out and gather information. Find underground fights with high prize money, and one of those guys that can make a fake identity, the more expensive it is, the better. We might need one of those. Dispel when you find one. 
He ordered the clones. The clones nodded shunshined away. He then created another 20 clones and ordered. You guys pick the pocket of anyone who might look like a rich guy you come across. Just get the cash then return the wallet from where you took it. We'll meet back here in one and a half hours. The clones then separated to find marks. Naruto learned to pickpocket since he was a kid. His harsh living conditions due to the hatred of his village resulted in him learning how to do it just to stay alive. Getting punched, choked, or stabbed when he gets caught certainly made for a powerful motivator. Walking out of the alleyway, he just continued his stroll down the sidewalk, and just enjoying the view. Chapter 5 The Fall of the Whirlpools Las Vegas, Nevada March 28, 2005 2100 H local. All right, how much we've got? Naruto said to his clones when he came to meet all the clones tasked with picking pockets. We know you'd ask us that boss, so we found out how much it is since we don't even know what each of the papers is worth. A clone then dispelled to send the information to the original. The memories of the clone rushed into his mind. He saw he successfully picked 42 marks in one and a half hours. It also showed seven denominations of the paper money, with its respective appearance called dollars. 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, and 100. He also got the memory of the basic number system, which is exactly like what his old world used except for the symbols for numbers. Good job, guys, but you may have gone a little overboard if the clone that just dispelled is any indication. So how much was our haul? $221,456. A clone said with a touch of giddiness. I still don't how much that is. Naruto said with a blank look. We found a store that sells instant ramen. Everyone got a dreamy look on their face imagining the food of the gods. And the cheapest sell them at around a dollar after taxes. Whoa. Based on that, we have approximately two South-class mission pay with us. We're rich. Every clone just nodded vigorously with a smile. Wait, what do you mean after taxes? He suddenly asked, noticing the weird wording used by his clone. Well, from what we gathered, stores just place the base price and add tax when ringing up the purchase. The weird thing is, it's different in different parts of the country. This country is divided into 50 smaller protectorates called states, and each of them has a different tax rate. Ugh, they just had to make it really hard. Sheesh. Okay, guys, great work. The clones one by one handed over the cash and dispelled. He placed a $1,000 of random bills in his pocket and sealed the rest for later use. That's a lot of money, Kit. We can finally go to stage two. When are we going to fight? Karama asked, vibrating with excitement. Well, three of the scouting clones already dispelled. The best one with big money is somewhere north of here in an abandoned warehouse. It looks like a lot of high rollers and VIPs are there, which means a lot of money. Naruto said, remembering the memories of the three clones that dispelled. The 17 remaining clones are just now looking for a fixer for fake identification. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go. Karama urged. Wait a minute. You might kill those guys accidentally. Everyone in this world only has enough chakra to keep them alive. Our civilians are tougher than the civilians of this world. Saiken said. Might I suggest upping your gravity seals and maximizing the resistance seals? Those would up you from 200 times gravity to 500 times, and from resistance level 8 to resistance level 10. Matatabi suggested. Not a bad idea. Wait a minute. Naruto said while adjusting the seals. He reminisced on how he got those seals, including his storage seal. Flashback start. 
When he decided to remove the bijou from the clutches of the hidden villages, he knew he needed to be a seal master just like his parents. He started learning from the only other seal master he knew, his godfather, Jiraiya of the Sanin. After he exhausted all of the knowledge available to his godfather, he prepared for a journey, a journey to the land of the master of the seals, Yuzushiogakur. Yuzushiogakur, or the village hidden in the whirlpools, was the home village of his mother. It was also known as the village of longe longevity, due to the long lifespans of the Uzumaki, the village without the country was located between fire and water country. The village became known for its seal masters attributed to Uzumaki's natural talent for building up and breaking down seals. Kirigakure, Iwagakure, and Kumogakure felt threatened by Yuzushiogakure's rise to power. They created an alliance of 120,000 troops which consists of 40,000 shinobis, 70,000 soldiers and conscripts, and 10,000 samurais. The last two were lent by their daimyos with the promise of overwhelming victory and massive spoils. Unfortunately for the alliance, they forgot one tenet of being a shinobi. Never fight a seal master on their own terms. Yuzushiogakure has a population of 15,000. 10,000 of which are combat ready with another 2,000 studying or retired shinobi. Of the total 12,000 available forces, 8,000 of them are seal adepts. A thousand of which are seal masters. When the alliance came on thousands of ships and pushed through Yuzushiogakure's infamous whirlpools, they were expecting the people to tremble in fear and surrender. What they didn't expect is an instant attack the moment they saw the walls. Even against overwhelming odds, the Uzumakis never wavered. They employed all the tricks to hold off the invading forces. They used suicide seal bombs, space-time traps, multi-elemental jutsus, and all the other tricks. Three days and two nights, they hold off the enemy forces expecting their sister village, Kanoha, would come to their rescue. But alas, they can't hold of destiny. Their time has come. In a final act of spite, they collected all their possessions. Metal, precious gems, relics, books, and scrolls. All of which are sealed in a single sealing scroll, only to be opened by a mainline Uzumaki. The scroll was then placed inside the country's strongest sealing vault. When all the people able to escape and all their valuables sealed, the remaining 1,000 shinobi sacrificed their lives to fuel a powerful powerful summoning jutsu. They summoned the death god. Exchange for the lives of a thousand Uzumaki blood, the death god would reap the souls of fifty thousand enemies, bringing them with them forever in the death god's stomach to suffer for eternity. When the battle ended, only three thousand of the one hundred and twenty thousand invading forces remained. Tired and demoralized, they entered the ruined city, expecting some form of loot. What they found were dust and ashes. Scouring the city only yielded them broken furniture, destroyed seals, and leftover home items. The security on the vault located in the depths of the city was unbreakable. Even the path to the vault is heavily trapped, resulting in casualties. By the time they left the city, only 2,800 forces were left. The plan to attack Kanoha with the 40,000 shinobis used to attack Yuzushiogakure was now an impossible dream. When Kanoha's advanced guard arrived the afternoon of the third day, they only saw the sails of the retreating enemy forces on the horizon. Entering the city with a heavy heart, they saw broken buildings, empty homes, and thousands of bodies. They saw the high tide of Kiri, IWA, and Kumo. They buried every civilian and shinobi of Yuzu they could find and erected a monument in their honor. They returned to Kanoha to inform the Hokage of the failure. As a tribute and a remembrance of their greatest failure, a red Uzumaki swirl is placed on all Kanoha flak jackets. Naruto arrived on Yuzushiogakure. He explored the city and found the memorial stone set by Kanoha shinobi when they buried the dead. He paid his respects and explored further, hoping to find something he can use or a relic of his ancestors. He then found a tunnel heading deep under the city. The city. 
The seals recognized his Uzumaki blood and turned off the traps. He reached a vast sealing array at the end of the path. Recognizing an identification array at the left side of the wall, he bit his thumb and pumped chakra to the array. A bright light spread across the whole room, temporarily blinding him. When the light died down, a single six-feet ceiling scroll was in front of the wall. He walked over to the scroll and reaching it with tears of joy in his eyes. When his fingers touched the scroll, his tears of joys became tears of pain. He felt his skin being cut over and over again. When the pain ended, he immediately opened his jacket and shocked by what he saw. Sealing array spread throughout his body, he barely recognized it as a complicated storage seal array. A huge bulk of information assaulted his brains. He recognized the relics, books, and fortune of the Uzumaki clan. With a renewed vigor, he studied all the scrolls and books using shadow clones. Tested thousands of seals. Failure after failure. Success after success. He took a year to learn everything, even with a veritable army of shadow clones. One of the first seals he placed on his body is an upgraded gravity seal. It can increase the gravity felt by the body, but the seal would also counter the downward force outside of the body, making the body have the same weight. Even if the seal were set to a thousand, you wouldn't fall through the floor. The resistance seal, on the other hand, would counter all the motions made by the body with an opposite force. Level 1 would be felt similar to walking through water, while level 10 would be equivalent to walking through metal. The best thing about both seals was that it's semi-autonomous. It will automatically raise the level of both seals when a certain level of mobility is achieved. Of course, the parameters can be changed manually. Flashback end. Okay. I'm ready. Wow. I haven't moved this slow since I returned to Kanoha after the training trip. Naruto mused while performing performing some simple calisthenics. Come on. We haven't seen any action since you started working on that Horatian gate. Karama complained. You do realize I would not use much chakra, if any, for some underground fight. Naruto said, pointing out the fact that Karama would not be able to do anything while walking towards the direction where his clone came from. Yeah yeah. I just want to see some fight. Ignore him, Naruto. Remember, Theatrix. It will win you over more money. If there's anything I learned from B, the money will come easier with a little Theatrix. Gyuki advised. After ten minutes of walking and idle chatter between the Bijou and him, he finally reached the warehouse, where the fight is happening according to the memory he received from his clone. Walking to the back of the entrance, he knocked on a nondescript wall. An eyehole slide open, and a guy asked with a large gravelly voice. A little dark out, huh? Recognizing a prompt, he recalled the memory for the prompt key. Yeah. Good thing, I just changed the bulb. The eyehole closed then a clicking sound was heard from the other side. The wall sunk back and slid to the side. Two massive guys greeted him. One dark-skinned and the other light-skinned. Both are bald and wearing a suit. Come on. The dark-skinned guard ordered. Naruto went in and is greeted by a long narrow brick hallway that ends with an intersection. The light-skinned guard closed the door and said. Stand over to the wall facing it. The guard then walked towards him and patted him down for weapons. Guest or fighter? Fighter. Naruto said in a confident tone. When the guard finished checking him for weapons, he said. Walk to the end of the hall and turn right. Knock on the door twice. Now go. The guard said with finality. Naruto then walked towards the hallway, facing downward. Nobody saw the mischievous grin he has on his face, even by the cam cameras. 
Chapter 6, The Fight and the Offer Las Vegas, Nevada March 28, 2005, 2120 H Local Naruto knocked on the door twice as instructed. The door opened a portion of the way showing a woman dressed in business attire. She had blonde hair and brown eyes. You're going to fight? The woman asked for confirmation. Yeah. Naruto replied. The woman stepped aside and motioned for him to come in. $2,000 entry fee. Every fight you win, you get $5,000. You win two fights, and you get in the tournament later. It's an all-or-nothing game. You get to take home $250,000, 5% of the gate, and 10% of your betting pool. The woman informed him in a brisk tone. Sign here before you fight. The woman continued while showing him a piece of paper. Naruto signed the paper with an alias of Menma. He then placed his hands in his pocket, unsealed some cash, and made a show of counting the money before placing $2,000 on the table. He then placed the remaining money in his pocket and sealed it again. When your number is called, you go to the ring. Your number is 32. When Naruto started walking towards the fighters' waiting area indicated by a huge assortment of guys wearing gloves, bandages, or just generally looking intimidating, he remembered something. He turned around to face the woman again. After he finally got the attention of the woman back, he asked. Can I make a bet? Sure. But you can't make a bet on you losing. Oh, never even crossed my mind. Is there a limit on the bets? The woman looked weirdly at him for a second and said, Minimum bet is a thousand dollars. Okay. He unsealed in his pockets two bundles of cash in his pocket and took it out. I'm betting one hundred thousand dollars that I'm going to win the whole thing and another one hundred thousand dollars that I'm gonna knock out every one of my opponents flat in under a minute. He said with a goofy smile on his face. This got the attention of everyone in the waiting room. The woman immediately regained her composure. She took the cash and noted it down without another word. Every one of his opponents is now giving him a hardened glare. He just shrugged off all the attention and walked to the far side of the room, giving him the vantage point to see everything in the place. He leaned back to the wall and lowered his hood to partially cover his eyes while making a note to buy some shades. He observed everyone in the room. He was taking note of their physique and mannerisms. He would have liked to use his dojitsu, but it just wouldn't be fair. He would be able to see all the weaknesses of his opponents. He saw that out of all the competitors, excluding himself, only five can compete with the average genin. That is, of course, without the use of chakra. The observation just made him sad. Is this what this world's fighters look like? That's just pathetic. Karama said with a hint of disbelief. Isn't that better? We could relax and take it easy. Isaba countered. Well, yeah. But we won't have any entertainment. Ugh, we can just find other entertainment. It won't be the end of the world. While the conversation of the bijou inside him continued, numbers 9 and 10 were called. A 6 feet 6 inches African-American guy with a beard that has been eyeing him for a while approached him. He scanned him up and down. After a few seconds, the guy said, You don't look much. I'll enjoy turning you to a paste. Without missing a beat, the guy walked out of the room. He must be number 9 or 10. After 30 minutes, he and the last guy in the room were called. His opponent, number 31, is a six Caucasian with developed muscles. He walked with confidence ahead of him. When they reached the end of the hallway, he saw an an octagonal cage. It looked to be a round to be 30 feet in diameter stage on top of a four-foot platform. The enclosure is six feet in height, 
completely enclosing the ring. A lot of seats are surrounding the ring, all of them wearing suits or dresses. This should be interesting, at least. Naruto said to himself. He followed the instructions of the man to go to one side of the stage. He removed his hoodie to reveal his long sleeve shirt. He walked up the stage and entered the cage. He walked to the center until Ho's face to face with his opponent. The referee approached them and said, This is a no holds bar fight. I'm the only rule here. You either win by your opponent tapping out, or I say you win. When I end the fight, you end the fight. No questions asked. You both understand. They both nodded. Okay, after you tap your fist, you start. The referee then walked to the side of the ring. Naruto's opponent keeps glaring at him. His answer, a bored expression. This just served to annoy his opponent more. Naruto raised his right fist to signify he would like to start the fight. 31 lifted his left fist and tapped it. The guy suddenly charged at him and drove his right fist hard straight to his face. Almost everyone thought it's another disappointing fight. The sad thing was, they were right. Number 31 suddenly toppled over and started coughing up blood. The audience can see that Naruto's left hand was now positioned for what was a body blow. The referee approached number 31 to check his condition. After a while, he stood up and signaled for the end of the fight. Naruto started walking away while muttering, but that's just a love tap. The audience heard this and started replacing some of their bets. Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005. 0200H local. Naruto and number 9, now known as Mike Lucas when his name was called for the final fight, is standing in the middle of the ring. He was the one who threatened Naruto to turn him into a paste. The fight announcer is typing out the crowd and calling for the end of the betting. Both of them easily dominated their own brackets until they met in the finals. Although Lucas stands at 6 feet 6 inches, he is swift and robust, allowing him to overwhelm his opponents with simple punches or grapple moves while dodging enemy attacks. Naruto, on the other hand, just tanks the blows and then delivering a devastating counterattack quickly dispatching his opponents. What kind of a name is Menma? Lucas mocked, pulling Naruto of his musing. It's the only name I have. Naruto lied then looked away, looking disinterested. H.M. I still don't know how you got here. There are a lot of guys who's better than you. Lucas continued to say, trying to pull Naruto out of his calm demeanor. Huh? Did you say something? Naruto said. Pulling a move from his sensei. That's it. You're dead. Growled out, Lucas. The referee approached them and explained the rules of the fight again. After finishing his explanation, he moved over to the side of the ring. The opponents both tapped their right fists with each other, and then Lucas moved away while maintaining his boxer's stance. Lucas is looking for any opening his opponent has, and that proved to be easy. Naruto is looking genuinely relaxed, leaving a lot of holes in his defense. Lucas rushed Naruto intending to land a punch to his jaw, hoping to end the fight quickly. When his fists made contact with his opponent's jaw, he felt like crying out in pain. It felt like punching a block of steel. A fist is suddenly flying towards his face. Only his experience and physique helped him dodge Naruto's counter by the skin of his teeth. He moves back to gain some breathing room. Hey. You're pretty fast. Naruto said. With a smile forming at his face, Naruto lowered his body into a basic academy style st stance. He had copied a large variety of fighting styles before he left the elemental nations. The basic academy style should be more than enough for this level of opponent. 
Lucas reassured himself that the previous engagement was just a fluke. He knows he can win with the tried and tested method of overwhelming the enemy with force and speed. He rushed forward significantly quicker. He rained punches on Naruto's head and body. Throwing out hooks, straight, uppercut, and body blows. He opted out to use kicks since he needs his feet to move quickly out of the way if Naruto ever tried to retaliate. Each punch he threw increased his confidence right until he felt his feet kicked right under him. The force of the blow almost fractured his leg. This caused his body to be momentarily unbalanced, causing him to take a blow to his right kidney. It felt like a car crashed into him, causing him to fold over. When he was falling down to his knees, Naruto threw a perfectly timed left uppercut, effectively keeping him upright, but dazed. Seeing the world spinning and doubled, he finally knew he bit off more than he can chew. Naruto moved back half a step and whirled, turning it to a brutal roundhouse kick. It laid out Mike Lucas, immediately turning his lights off. A few pieces of tooth flew out of his mouth, alongside spit and blood. Seeing the state of Lucas, the referee immediately raised Naruto's hand, indicating he won the fight. Naruto was led to a back room where he could collect his winnings. Summing up all the money he won, including his bets, which accounts for the majority of his winnings, he racked up $1,220,000, bringing his total available cash to $1,239,456. He placed all his winning into a backpack to avoid using his storage seal. Naruto walked out of the warehouse with the intent of getting food in one of those convenience stores and a motel to sleep in when he sensed a large group of people circling his position. When he reached the front of the warehouse, a 5 feet 11 inches Caucasian man walked up to him. He has a shaved head and a monocle on his right eye. He extended his hand for a handshake. Good evening, or should I say good morning, Mr. Menma. Naruto immediately shook the man's hand, outwardly showing a friendly and open attitude, but on the inside, he's already on guard. He ordered Kurama to scan the surroundings for possible hostile intent. You have me at a disadvantage here, Mr. Strucker. Baron Wolfgang von Strucker. The two unclasped their hands and looked at each other for a moment, trying to get a read on each other. After a few more seconds, Naruto asked. Well, Mr. Strucker, I doubt you would approach me at this time without some form of business. Ah, uh, a straight-to-the-point kind of guy. I like it. Mr. Menma, I represent a certain organization with the intent of helping the world to achieve a higher level of greatness. Your skills and physical capabilities would be a great boon for us. Baron Strucker said with a friendly smile. Naruto acted like he was thinking about it positively for a while. The organization he spoke of is highly dubious. What kind of organization with the intent of helping people has 25 probably heavily armed guards surrounding a man they are trying to recruit, recruits people with questionable background found in an underground fight, or aims for people with high skill and physical level for helping people? It all just stinks to high heaven. He concluded that this organization is a lot like Akatsuki. He just has no idea how right he is. So, what do you want from me? Naruto finally said. I would like you to join us in our endeavor. Strucker replied. If I join, what would be my job and its benefits? Naruto asked, showing his interest. With your skills, you would mostly be doing escort work of our high-level executives, while doing some odd jobs here and there. As for pay, we pay on the high side of the spectrum with exceptional personal benefits. Wow. That's just awesome. I really would love to sign up. But... Strucker said, sensing the continuation of the sentence. I just left my previous job, and I'm on vacation. I'm going to tour the world a bit before everything else. But I would like to sign up if it's still available, maybe in a year? 
Naruto offered to get this organization off his back while he's still adjusting to the world. Strucker nodded and took a small card from his pocket. He gave it to Naruto and said, That's acceptable. That there is my eye. Personal information and contact details, both office and personal. I hope to hear from you soon. Good day, Mr. Menma. With the final statement, Strucker left. Naruto just stood by the sidewalk while acting like he was looking at the card when in reality, he is sensing where Strucker and his guards would go. As he was looking at the card though, he sensed an underlying current of electricity inside. He guessed that the card has some kind of tracking technology in it. To be safe, he used a small pulse of lightning release, electromagnetic murder in his hands to fry the circuit inside the card. Naruto then walked down the street, when he sensed his finally alone, intent on having a meal, and ending his long first day in another world. Las Vegas, Nevada March 29, 2005, 0315H Local Sir, the beacon in the card stopped responding. An assistant said to Strucker while inside the car. Hmm. He's not as stupid as I thought. What to do, what to do? Strucker said while tapping his chin. Prioritizing his goals, he built up a plan, I want his movement tracked. Send me a report every month. He looks like he might be a great addition to Hydra. I just hoped he would make the right choice. I would hate to be less than a gentleman when inquiring how he achieved a high level of human conditioning at such a young age. Even if he's busy, we can use him for super soldier experimentation. Yes, sir. The assistant acknowledged the order. The order. Hydra has no idea what calamity they would bring to themselves. Cause no head would grow on a Hydra if there is nobody left. Chapter 7, First Crumbs. Edwards Air Force Base, California. March 29, 2005, 0300 H Local. The general and the two technical sergeants have been poring over the recordings and the reports all through the night trying to make sense of the occurrence. They first considered it as a glitch in the system, but immediately scrapped that idea. The systems are operational and no errors are found even through a rigorous battery of tests. General Powell has opted out of going home to study the instantaneous appearance of the man in the middle of the Mojave Desert. This mysterious man obviously constitutes a breach in national security. If he is capable of showing up like that anywhere, what's to say he won't be able just to show up inside the White House and assassinated the president without anyone being able to do anything? Worse yet, he can get in anywhere and take anything out, like nuclear launch codes. Do anyone else know about this, or have a copy of this recording? General Powell asked the two sergeants seriously. No, sir. We immediately took this to you. The only copy left is in the system hard drive you locked down. Collins replied. Good, from now on, this is classified above top secret for eyes only. You will forget this ever happened unless addressed explicitly by the President, the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staffs, and me. Is that understood? Powell said while giving them a hard glare. Yes, sir. The two sergeants saluted. Okay, you both are dismissed. Take a week off, but keep your phone with you in case you are needed to be called over. The two sergeants saluted and walked off nervousness and fatigue radiating from their bodies. The general took his office phone and dialed a number. The phone ringed three times until someone answered on the other side. This is General Colin Powell, service ID number 58345244. The general said, Early in the morning for you, general, what can I do for you? A female voice replied, I need to set up a teleconferencing meeting with all the chief of staff and POTUS as soon as possible. This is a code orange emergency. Understood. I'll call you back for the details. 
Thank you. The general hanged up the phone and stared at a still frame of the man standing in the middle of the desert. He stood up, poured himself a drink, and drank it all in one shot while quietly muttering, Who the hell are you? Central Park, New York City, New York. March 29, 2005, 0700 H Local. Nothing like good coffee in the morning. Agent Phil Coulson said as he was walking towards the site of the event. By his side is Agent Clint Barton drinking his own cup of coffee while silently scanning his surroundings, a trait he can't seem to turn off even when he knows the area is safe. Trailing behind them are the field agents and techs they brought with them each carrying gears they might need. When they reached the cordoned off area, they saw NYPD cops guarding the area with some civilians milling around. Both Coulson and Barton identified some of those civilians as undercover shield agents tasked with guarding the site. The cordoned off area is approximately 20 m x 20 m. A large area since the exact point of the event can't be determined since no marks were left on the ground. Only the approximate area was determined from video recordings and eyewitness accounts, all of which are from a distance. Coulson approached one of the cops and asked in a friendly tone. Can you point me to who's in charge? The cop looked slightly annoyed for a moment, but then saw the guy who asked him, including the large group behind him. Looking at the group's fancy attire and equipment, equipment, he concluded that these are the feds they're waiting for. He nodded in acknowledgement and looked around for his boss. When he saw him, the cop looked back at the fed asking him and said, You see the guy with the brown jacket, that's Lieutenant Avery. He's the one you want to talk to. The cop said while pointing behind him. Thank you for your cooperation, officer. Coulson said in gratitude. Coulson ducked below the cordon and walked over to where Lieutenant Avery is standing. Barton, on the other hand, walked around the area to try spot something unusual. The agents and techs just stood just outside the area, waiting for orders. Good morning, Lieutenant Avery. How are you? I'm Agent Coulson, and that guy in the jean jacket looking around is Agent Barton. We're the reinforcements you're waiting for. Coulson said while extending his hands. Avery shook Coulson's hand and said, Pleasure to meet you. We're cold but otherwise okay. Good thing you came now. We're just about ready to bug out in 30 minutes, and I don't want to leave this place unguarded, but it's all hands on deck later in the morning. Protesters for that Terry Schiavo case would gather on Times Square later today. No problem. That Terry Schiavo case is rather complicated. So, what can you tell me about what happened here? Coulson said, reeling in the conversation to the topic at hand. Some of my units canvassed the area and collected witness statements. We also requested copies of CCTV footage from both traffic, police, and building CCTVs around this area from 8.25 to 8.45 p.m. That should give you guys something to work on. The written reports and the discs are at 1 p.p. Just have one of your men find Deputy Chief Martel. Avery informed Coulson. That's great, Lieutenant. You and your boys can go home. We'll take it from here. Much appreciated, Agent Coulson. Lieutenant Avery said. He then looked over to the cops guarding the area and shouted, Come on. On. We're going for a quick chow then going home. Avery and the other cops then left the area. Coulson watched them go for a moment then walked over to his men. Mahoney and Johnson, take a car and get those reports. It'll be at 1 pp, talk to Deputy Chief Martel. Diaz and James, your security. The others, you know your jobs. Go. Coulson ordered. The agents and techs immediately scrambled to accomplish their orders. As this was happening, Barton walked over to Coulson's side. You know, we should expand the perimeter. Barton suggested. Why? 
What did you see? Carlson asked curiously. Follow me. Barton then walked to the center of the cordoned off area with Carlson following him. When they reached the center, Barton handed over to Carlson pair of binoculars he was holding. Look over there. Can you see that tree over there? The cherry blossom? Barton asked while pointing to a tree some distance away. Yeah. What am I looking for? Coulson asked while looking through the binoculars. Look at the trunk, near the base of the tree. Is that kanji script? Yup, but it has Hindi and other scripts I can't identify. That mark, it's exactly north of here and 100 meters far from where we're standing. You can measure it. Yeah. I believe you. Coulson said trusting Barton's skill. That's not all. Look behind you, another blossom. That's exactly 100 m south of here. Those writings are present in all eight directions exactly 100 m from this spot. The weird thing is, I'm fairly certain they were not there before the event. Why would you say that? If I'm right and all those trees are exactly 100 m from here, it's just too perfect of a placement. It's unnatural. You're right. Carlson finally agreed. He called over a tech and ordered. I want you to mark where I'm standing. Using this as a reference, measure the distance and the direction from here to that tree over there. When you have it, come back to me. The, the technician nodded and executed Carlson's orders. Barton and Carlson moved over to the perimeter of the area. So, what's your take on this? Barton asked. Well, I got a lot of idea of what might have happened. None of them are conclusive. If I added those weird symbols, it becomes a little more worrying. Care to share some of it? I'm currently thinking of two of the possibly worst outcome. One, something or someone activated a type of a beacon. To what end, I have no idea. Carlson said in a serious voice, losing his trademark smile. Or, Barton said, urging Carlson to continue. Something or someone came over. We have no eyewitness accounts except for a flash of light, and those symbols are clearly marking this area if what you said is true. Barton just remained dumbfounded on Carlson's hypothesis. Thinking it over, both of those scenarios are undoubtedly possible, especially in their line of work. While Barton was mulling over what Carlson just said, the tech approached them. Sir, the tree is exactly north of where you were just standing. It's also exactly a hundred meters away from the trunk to the center of the area. The tech reported. Carlson faced Barton and said, Looks like you were right. Carlson faced the tech again and said, Okay, here's what I want you to do. Take another four guys with you. Do the same thing should be present for the trees 100 m away in all eight compass directions. Record everything you can. I want tree samples, photographs, and aerial mapping with all the coordinates. I want you to focus on the marks on the base of the tree. We'll get right on it, sir. Carlson watched as the tech walked away, calling some other techs. I hoped that would shed some light on it. Carlson mused. I just hope you're wrong. Barton answered. MGM Grand Hotel, Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005, 0800H Local. Hello? A drowsy Natasha Romanoff answered the phone. Good morning, Ms. Rockford. This is your requested, requested 8 a.m. wake up call. The receptionist on the other side reminded in a jolly voice. Oh, thank you. Can you confirm my spa appointment? Certainly, Ms. Rockford. One moment, please. Tapping sound could be heard on the other end of the line. Your appointment was set at 10 a.m. Is that acceptable? Yes, that's perfect. 
Oh, can you send up an English breakfast and two large black coffee? Certainly, Ms. Rockford. Is there anything else? No. Nothing else. Thank you. Natasha then hanged up the phone. After finishing her morning ritual, she changed into blue jeans, a white t-shirt, white sneakers, and a black leather jacket. She heard a knock on the door while finishing her makeup. She looked into the eye hole who was on the other side. When she saw it's her room service, she opened her door and gestured the hotel attendant to bring the food in. The attendant set the food up and left, receiving a $50 tip. Natasha called Fury while eating her meal. Good morning, boss. Natasha greeted Fury. You left me quite a puzzle, Romanov. Fury answered in reply. The picture you sent of one Naruto Uzumaki didn't come up on any database. He's basically a ghost. Even on the overseas databases? I should amend my statement. He didn't come up on every database. Fury said with a touch of annoyance. I'll try to find him while I'm here. He's probably really good to not have any record of him. Natasha said not knowing that Naruto didn't come from their world. Tread carefully, Agent Romanoff. I still have a need for you yet. Fury said in a half-joking manner. Ha ha ha. Sure thing, boss. Thanks for the favor. Goodbye, Agent Romanoff. Fury said then hanged up the phone. Natasha placed her phone in her pocket and finished her meal. She left her room to attend her spa appointment while thinking about how to accomplish her self-imposed mission. Chapter 8, A Scary Plan Motel 6, Las Vegas, Nevada March 29th, 2005, 1300H Wow I haven't slept in a bed for so long. Naruto said to nobody in particular while stretching his body out like a cat. That's just part of the course. You don't need sleep, remember. Matatabi reminded. You're a lot like Gara when he was a kid. Good times, good times. Shikaku said with a sense of nostalgia. You were threatening the kid of taking his body over when he sleeps. How can that be a good time? Chome countered. Well, a good time for me, not for him. Sheesh. Shikaku defended himself. Shut up. It's too early for you broadcasting your infighting in my head. Naruto interjected before the fighting escalates. Kit, it's one in the afternoon. Karama deadpanned. Well, it's no more than ten minutes. Since I woke up, so it's still early. Naruto said in a deadpan voice. Naruto sometimes thinks that he could relate to people with mental health issues, like say a voice in your head. In his case, nine distinct personalities that's capable of leaving his body and destroy a whole world. It's a good thing he can turn off the connection to the bijou, or he would seriously doubt his sanity by this time. He stood up and went to the bathroom. After washing up, he sat in front of the desk in his room and stared at the mirror, looking directly at his reflection. I have close to a 1,000 clones in the city of Los Angeles still gathering basic information, none here in Las Vegas since all of them popped when they found a Class A forger, forger while I was sleeping. Now what should I do? Naruto thought to himself. When suddenly, he banged his head on the table. The holy grail of answers is in front of him. I'll place some reinforced siphoning clones with Horatian tags to all of the major cities in the world. That would make it a lot easier to move around. And if each of those clones can create more clones that can use transformation and my dojitsu, I can make an undetectable instant information network. It's going to be better than what Erosenin has. With his mind made up, he walked over to the bed and unsealed a duffel bag and a backpack. Naruto placed 5,110 Horatian tags in the duffel bag 
and 511 reinforcement siphoning tags in the pack. He then created a shadow clone. Find an abandoned warehouse or building somewhere and place a reinforcement tag on you. You then are going to create another 510 clones with a reinforcement tag on them. Each one of you would then pick one major city and place 10 Horatian tags in any safe are you deem fit. Don't worry about Los Angeles. When it's all done, you're going to make an information gathering cell on that city and any nearby area. Try to get in as many classes as possible and read all the books in the library. Look into that internet too, if possible. Create and dispel a clone every day or if something important happens. Got it? Naruto ordered with great enthusiasm. Visibly vibrating with excitement on the prospect of his new idea. Yes, boss. No problem, leave it to me. The clone saluted and shoe shined away, leaving an open window. What do you plan with doing with all that knowledge, Gaki? Gyuki asked with apprehension. He knows that knowledge is power and power corrupts. That much information flowing to one person won't be healthy. Well, of course, we're going to sell it. Naruto exclaimed with vigor. What? All the bijou shouted in shock. That way of thinking is totally out of character for Naruto. He's the kind of guy that will easily give up a lot to help the good guys. B.A. Chan said that people would be really suspicious of what they've taken for free. So we sell the information on the bad guys to the good guys. That way we can help people while still earning some money. Smart, right? Naruto could clearly feel the gaping faces of the bijus. When the hell did you get that smart? Shikaka shouted. My little boy's all grown up. Kurama said while wiping away a fake tear. Hey. I'm not that bad, am I? Naruto said the last part in a pleading tone. Well, you were pretty bad. Shouting about being Hokage all the time running head straight to the enemy without thinking. Yup, you were pretty bad. Karama asserted. Well, fuck you too, guys. Naruto then stood up and sealed all his items except for the decoy bag. He walked out of the room and headed to the front desk. Room 225, checking out. Naruto said to the receptionist. Certainly, sir. That would be $62. The receptionist said after looking over the records. Naruto took out a $100 bill and handed it over. Here you go. Say, can you recommend a good casino? Maybe poker? Naruto asked, trying to find out where is the best place to go next. The Bellagio is a favorite for amateurs and high rollers. They have different buy-in tables from a thousand dollars to a million dollars on their floor. I heard they also host high-stakes poker with a minimum buy-in of 50 million. The receptionist informed Naruto. Well, here's your change, sir. I hope you stay with us again. Thank you. Naruto walked out of the motel. His first order of business get himself self a new identity, or two. Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29th, 2005, 1400 H local. Naruto is walking towards the house of who could make him a new identity. His clones heard about it from some crime boss talking about bugging out of Las Vegas since the cops are hot on his trail. Further, research about the guy showed that he's a U.S. State Department, which apparently does something about international relations, employee, and a hacker which means he can create legitimate clean identities, including IDs and passports. The perfect guy for the job. His services would cost $200,000 per identity. He usually wouldn't do transactions on a weekday, since he is a government employee. Still, the clone's memories showed that the guy didn't come into work due to a foot fracture, which is certainly not the fault of one his clones accidentally dropping a pot on the guy's feet. Nearing the apartment building, 
he ducked into an alleyway and created two shadow clones. One of the clones transformed into a guy who looks a lot like Sasuke, and the other into his sexy jutsu form. Satisfied with the transformation of his clones, he and his clones walked towards the apartment building. Walking up the third floor, he knocked on room 303. Shuffling could be heard on the other side of the door. The door opened, showing a pasty, skinny, 5 feet 6 inches Caucasian man. Jeremy Michaels was an ordinary 23-year-old guy. He was working a dead-end 8-to-5 job for the government. Day after day, week after week, it was all the same. The operating word is was. One day, his uncle Martin approached him with a request. His friend was unwittingly involved in a money laundering scheme. The FBI is already on his tail. What he needed from him is to create a new identity for his friend. His job and his skill with a computer would make it relatively easy for him to create a new identity for his friend. This one request would grow into his new sideline job. He studied the bureaucracy of the government to create better paper trail trails. He bought equipment to make perfect imitations of IDs and passports. He managed to stay hidden by being smart. Only his uncle could contact him about the orders, and they always use code phrases. This made sure that nobody's the wiser. The fact that three people he doesn't know is now standing in front of his door is a little disconcerting. Are you Jeremy Michaels? The blonde guy standing in the center asked. Yes. Jeremy drawled out. I met this girl in the bar. Her boyfriend left her so now she's looking for a new phone. The guy said in a straight tone. Jeremy's heart rate immediately shot up. The guy he never met just said his uncle's code for a new job. Is he a cop? Doesn't look like one. Maybe Uncle Martin just let the code phrase slip somewhere. But how can he find out where I live? Either way, I can't bluff out of this. It's better if I let things play out. Jeremy thought to himself. The guy just stared at him, while the other two are just looking around. Jeremy took a deep breath and said. Come in. I have some phones I can give away. The blonde guy smiled and just walked inside, followed by the intense-looking black-haired guy and a bubbly, hot, blonde chick. Jeremy looked around outside for a moment and closed the door. He hobbled his way to the living room and saw the three people looking around his living room. Jeremy cleared his throat to get the trio's attention. He then pointed at the couch to allow the three to sit. Jeremy then walked over to a chair that faced the trio. There were a few seconds of awkward silence until Naruto broke the ice. Relax, Jeremy. We are not cops or criminals. We're just in need of your services. Naruto said to calm Jeremy down. People who are need of my services aren't exactly clean. Jeremy countered with a little shake of his voice. Well, that's true. But you haven't met three abused siblings who faked their deaths and are trying to run away. Naruto lied us using a plot in one of the books his clones read. Oh, Jeremy said, losing most of his tension. But how did you know about my uncle's code phrases? You're smart, Jeremy, but you have nothing on my sister here. Naruto pointed to his female clone. She can connect dots that don't even exist. And this broody guy right here, he worked out the rest. Naruto then pointed to the Sasuke look-alike. Of course, none of what he said was true. When the clone heard about the crime boss needing a new identity, he just followed the trail until it ended on one Martin Michaels. Finding no indication that Martin is the one forging new identities, the clone broke into his safe and read Martin's journal. That's where the code phrases and information was written. It is a foolish move on Martin's part. That's good, I guess. Jeremy said, thinking about how to work around the problem.
If some random siblings can work out his side job and location, others can certainly do it too. Well, what do you guys need? He said, moving the issue aside and thinking about it for later. My siblings and I all need new identities. The faster you can do it, the better. I'll add 25,000 on top of your fee for each identity, if you can produce the IDs and passports by tonight. There's another 25,000 for you if you can acquire us some high-limit credit cards by the same time. How about the paper trail? That would take some time. Jeremy asked, thinking about the work needed to make a high-class forgery. Don't worry about it. You can work on that at your usual pace. Naruto said while waving his hand about. Jeremy thought it over for over a minute. It would be tight, but if he postpones making the paper trail by tomorrow, he can certainly make it. The extra money would be an awesome bonus. All right, I can have it done by seven. I just need to take your photo and details. You can wait here while I finish it up. The blonde guy just smiled brightly, stood up, took his hand, and shook it vigorously. You can put my name as Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. The broody guy is Nathan Umber, and my sister is Hannah Fox. That way, we can't all be traced if one of us is found out. You can do anything you want with it as long as no one would be able to link us to each other. Naruto said. Jeremy taught of the ways he can make the three identities separate. Okay, come with me to the back to polish up the details. Jeremy said after he stood up. Jeremy walked to the back room, shaking his head, thinking about the situation he put himself into. An energetic blonde, a broody brunette, and a cheerful chick. What weird group siblings. Well, at least it's not some assassin, or a spy looking into him. Chapter 9, Hot on Your Trail Las Vegas, Nevada March 29, 2005, 1400 H Local Natasha is just finishing up her lunch. Her self-imposed mission is still continuously eating at her. She can't concentrate on relaxing, while she hasn't yet solved the mystery of one Naruto Uzumaki. Something in the back of her mind has been nagging her that Naruto is something special, hiding something big. She knows that Naruto would most probably be still in Vegas, the question is where. If she follows what Naruto said, she will find him in one of the casinos, otherwise, she has no clue. Giving up on trying to relax, she left some cash on the table and walked up to her room. When she got inside, she took both of her Glock 26 Gen 4, a Ruger EC9, a pair of carambits, spare shots for her gauntlets, and a couple of magazines from her case. She also retrieved her specialized ballistic mesh and wore it under her shirt, covering all the bulging parts with her jacket. She put her Glocks in the holster by the small of her back, her Ruger at her right calf, carambits at the left calf, and the spares and magazines at the inside of her jacket. It might be overkill, but to where she's going, she might just need it all to get out. She took her room key and valet ticket and walked out of the room, making sure to lock it behind her. She walked to the lobby and showed her ticket to the valet counter to call her car. When her vehicle arrived, she placed a tip in the jar and immediately got on and drove off. She drove until she reached a medium-sized Italian restaurant on the north side of Las Vegas. She parked in the restaurant's parking lot, got off, and went inside while making sure her car's locked. She strode confidently inside the restaurant and approached the maitre d. Good afternoon. I have a reservation under the name Vinny. Natasha said confidently. The maitre d slightly narrowed her eyes. She looked to the manager behind her waiting for instructions. Natasha followed the maitre d's line of sight and saw the manager talking to a walkie-talkie. She looked around and saw a CCTV camera pointed at the reception table. After a few exchanges, the manager nodded to indicate to let her in. Mr. Bianchi is in the back. Straight through the kitchens. 
Have a good day, Ms. Vidova. Natasha is definitely sure now they remembered her. Vidova is Italian for widow. Natasha walked through the restaurant floor. She can see the tense posture of the waiters and the watchful eye of the manager. Shrugging off the attention, she continued to walk to the kitchen door. As soon as she walked inside the kitchen, everyone stopped. This place is even worse than the restaurant floor. All the cooks are giving her hostile glances while holding different sizes of knives, sharpening it or cutting meat. If she were anyone else, they would have been shaking in her boots, but she is not anyone else. She has seen where monsters are born. This intimidation is nothing on her. She walked past the kitchen and head straight to, to a meeting room, being guarded by two hefty guys wearing a suit with a BT MP9 machine pistol. I'm here to see Vinny. Natasha said to the guards. Both guards just grunted and opened the door. Natasha walked through the door. She saw ten guards with similar looks and load out to the guard she just saw. By the right side wall of the room is the CCTV monitor screen manned by a skinny guy in glasses. In the center of the room, there is a 3M diameter table. Sitting directly opposite the door, a massive older man leisurely eating a plate of spaghetti with a side of wine. On the opposite side of the man is another plate of spaghetti and a glass of wine. Have a meal with Ms. Vidova, or should I say, Ms. Romanoff? The man said. He saw Natasha looking at the food warily, don't worry, none of the food is poisoned. It's sacrilegious to waste good food and wine. He reassured. Natasha's face remained neutral as she walked to the table and sat on the chair in front of the food. She then heard the two guards outside walked in and closed the door, effectively cutting her off from her only exit. What can I do for you, Ms. Romanoff? It's not like you would come to me for nothing unless you just want to die, then that can certainly be arranged. Vinnie Bianchi threatened. Vincent Bianchi, or Vinny, is a huge 70-year-old man with graying hair, black eyes, and large eye bags under it. He is the current head head of the Bianchi crime family. He had expanded the family's operations through smart and efficient management, making the Bianchis gain control of Vegas underground. The bad blood between Natasha and Vinny came from one of the last jobs she did before being cornered by S.H.I.E.L.D. She was hired to assassinate Vinny's only son, Luca Bianchi, in the hope that the one who hired her can take control of the family during the confusion. She disguised herself as a high-priced escort to infiltrate Luca's penthouse suite. She drugged Luca with a paralytic drug and staged that he killed himself through hanging. The reason she was identified as the killer was through Vinny's stubbornness. He didn't believe for a moment that his son killed himself. He used all of his contacts until he came upon the Black Widow. The only reason she can go to Vegas without being continuously shot at or assassinated is due to an agreement brokered for her between S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Bianchis. As long as she doesn't wander into their area, the widow would get to live, at least that's how they phrased it. I need a favor. Natasha said, channeling her black widow persona. And why in the hell should I do this for you and not just put a bullet through your brain? Vinny exclaimed. Don't be like that, Vinny. You know it's only a job. It's just business, nothing personal. I'm sure you can understand. Natasha placated. It's personal to me. Vinny roared in anger. The guards hold on to their guns, getting ready to attack their guest. Natasha remained calm and let the tension slowly die down. When the tension got at low as it gets, she finally said. I know you're going help me this, Vinny. Vinny took a deep breath and said. Now, why is that? Cause you'll finally get to know who hired me. The world stopped for Vinny. He always knew that the widow is only the hired gun, but with so many suspects, he can't do anything. He can finally bring retribution for his son's death. Tell me. 
Vinny said in a clipped tone, fixing Natasha with a hard glare. No, you're going to do my thing first before I tell you anything. Vinny thought it over for a moment. It doesn't look like it, but the widow holds all the cards the moment she said she would tell about who hired her. They can't force it of her since she'll just bring it to the grave with her. They knew her reputation. Sure of his decision, Vinny eventually nodded. Great. Besides, you'll forget all about me the moment I say who it is. I'm going to reach into my pocket and bring out a photo. Natasha stated, to not draw alarm. She reached into her right jacket pocket slowly and brought out a photo of Naruto. She placed it faced up on the table and slid it over in front of Vinny. I want information on him, mainly where he is. You have eyes and ears everywhere in this city. You're the fastest way to find him. His name is Naruto Uzumaki, if that helps. Vinny took the photograph on the table and looked at it for a moment. He stood up and went to the monitors. He motioned for Natasha to follow him. I know this guy. Saw him myself. But he didn't use that name. He used some weird s name. Mama, Mana, Menma. That's right, Menma. Vinny looked at the CCTV operator and said, Load up all the fights of the champion last night. Vinny turned his gaze to the widow. See, this guy. Vinny said while waving around the photo. Is every fighting coach's dream. He can take punches, he's quick, he's strong, he's accurate, he has the experience, and most importantly, he's got skills. Natasha looked at the monitor playing a compiled video. She saw Naruto took punches that would bring down anyone else like nothing, and throwing punches that knocked the air out of everyone else. The final clip shows a beautifully executed combination ending in a roundhouse kick. It was all she can do not to gape in shock. She finally has a confirmation of what Naruto can do. That guy took home more than 1.2 mil that night. Vinny said with a smile when the video ended. You organize fights with million dollar prize money? Natasha asked for confirmation. No, the tournament prize is only quarter of a mil, plus gate commission, and bet commission. The most he can get is maybe 350k. Most of the money came from betting for himself. 100k for winning the whole thing, and another 100k for winning every fight in under a minute. Thought we just have another cocky guy with too much money. The widow just stared dumbfounded at the screen while hearing Vinny's answer. I'm going to take a copy of his fights. Do you know where he stayed the night? Vinny nodded to the operator. Last I heard he stayed at Motel 6. Checked out just 30 minutes ago. Vinny said, remembering the info. Natasha took the CD handed over by the operator and pocketed it. A deal is a deal, Vinny. Your brother Giovanni ordered the hit. He hoped you'd give up being head if your son died. Vinny and his guards took a moment to register what Natasha said. After a few seconds, Vinny said in denial. Why should I believe you? He's family. He won't do it. Natasha started to walk out the door and turned around. I got no reason to lie. I bet it's Giovanni who pointed you to my direction. Well, goodbye, Vinny. I have somewhere else to be. Natasha continued to the door blocked by the pair of guards. After receiving a nod from their boss, the pair opened the door and let the widow out. Vinny sat down and stared at the closed door for almost a minute. He finally regained his voice and said to his men. Looks like we got to clean house. Natasha drove away from the restaurant towards Mo Motel 6, hoping to find another piece of the puzzle. Shield New York Field Office, New York. March 29th, 2005, 1000H Local. Coulson is now poring over witness reports.
Every recorded statement is basically useless. Each account is the same. A bright flash of light occurred in Central Park. The weird thing was, there are no people anywhere close to the area, even though it's pretty close to a path. It's like everyone avoided the area at that exact time. Unbeknownst to Carlson, the seals placed on the anchor seal has an integrated repulsion seal. The Horatian gate works by sending four chakra seals to a random world with a given a set of specifications. These seals would be used as a guide by the Horatian gate to send someone through safely. A side effect of the anchor is it would create trees for each seal due to the high level of nature chakra used to power the gate. As a precaution to minimize errors and make anyone on the other side as safe as possible, a modified repulsion barrier would be formed the moment the anchor is set until the user is transported. Coulson was still reading through the files when a tech approached him. Sir, we have examined those marks on the trees. The symbols we can translate are endurance, love, of, sword. We have no idea of its significance. The important thing we found out, sir, is that the symbols are made up of smaller symbols. We only found out about it when we used a microscope lens on the camera. There are numerous repeating symbols. We can translate the words anchor, bridge, gate, and away. Coulson immediately got a cold feeling wash over him. But sir, we hit a problem for one of your orders. The tech continued. What is it? We can't take any significant samples from the tree. We have taken some leaves and bark, but we can't take any wood core samples. We just can't cut into it. What do you mean you can't cut into it? Sir, we use chainsaws, diamond-coated blade circular saw, and even a laser. We can't even make a mark on the wood itself, only the bark. The tech reasoned. Carlson thought for a moment. Seeing that there really is nothing to be done, he said. Make do with what you have. Send a report ASAP. Carlson dropped what he was reading and walked to the balcony. He took out his phone and called someone. The phone ringed a couple of times until the person on the other side answered. Give me something, Carlson. Fury said. Sir, we might have a situation. Coulson said in a grave tone. We might have an alien on the loose. Chapter 10, Still Lucky Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada March 29, 2005, 1930 H Local Naruto is now walking through the doors of the Bellagio. He just came from Jeremy Michaels's place and now phase three of the plan is a go. He just got his ID, passports, and credit cards. Jeremy sure did go above and beyond since he got social security cards, driver's license from three different states for each identity, New York, California, and Florida, birth certificates, and finally, permit to carry license for the guns this world loves so much. Jeremy also delivered on those credit cards. He repurposed some black market credit card accounts with a $100,000 limit to make them legit. All of which are billed to a P.O. box. Now he can have a paper trail, which is apparently a fundamental concept in this world. He learned that someone without a paper trail is really suspicious. The hidden villages would love to adapt this so they can keep track of everyone. The only downside to being a good guy doing bad stuff is that he had paid Jeremy 750 k for everything. If he really is an asshole, he would just do what Karama is saying. If you just used a Jinjutsu on him, you can vet away without him even remembering. Karama said. Well, I don't want to be an asshole, all right? Naruto defended himself. You bought illegally made papers and identification. Son Goku said in a deadpan voice. That's just a necessity because of my situation, and you know it. Naruto countered. Currently, he only had $483,374 left, which is a lot more than what he started with, 
but he needs some serious capital to get the next part of his plan started. That's the reason he was walking through the doors of the Bellagio. The receptionist of the motel he stayed at said this was the best place to play poker. Ever since he met Sinade B.A. Chan, he found out his talent for gambling. It doesn't matter what game it is, as long as it is based on chance. Even if it's rigged, he would somehow still win. As Karama so eloquently described it one time, as you have a stupid amount of luck for things that barely matter. It's like you made Lady Luck your bitch, and she just can't say no to you. Now fate, that's where he is a little angry with. It's like it piled on all the enormous problems of the world on his shoulder. But he's not going to open that can of worms any time soon, right now he has some games to win. Naruto went ahead and looked around. This place sure had a typical high-class casino down. Bright lights, expensive paintings, suit-up dealers, and security. Security everywhere, at least you can see their effort trying to blend in. He looked around and saw a sharply dressed attendant approaching him. Good evening to the Bellagio Hotel and Casino. The best place to relax and enjoy. How can I help you, sir? The attendant said, with a friendly smile. Naruto just smiled back and said the following in a conversational tone. It's my first time in Vegas, and I had heard great things about this place, especially about the poker tables. Can you point me to where those are? Thinking that Naruto is a customer easy to make money out of, the attendant immediately led him to across the casino floor. You are right on that, sir. We are known for exquisite poker rooms, equipment, and atmosphere. We have over 50 poker tables in the central area alone. We have several private rooms that can be rented for more private games. Both of them finally reached the poker room. The attendant opened the door for Naruto. Welcome to the Bellagio Grand Poker Room. We have increasing buy-in from left to right. You can join or leave a table after every round. The attendant pulled out a card and handed it over to Naruto. If you have any problems, just call the number on this card and find Ricardo Falcone. He can help you out. Good luck, sir. The attendant walked away and called someone on his phone. Mr. Falcone. It's Morris Grant. I just got a new possible mark. I'm from the Bellagio. Ricardo Falcone is an intimidating 45-year-old man. He is a lone shark working for the Bianchi crime family. He uses inside men in casinos to look for unsuspecting and gullible tourists to loan money to when they lose in the casino. He then cons or intimidates the target to pay back the money with significant interest. He pays the inside man a percentage of each successful loan. Morris is one of the more successful inside men due to the addictive and unpredictable nature of poker. He just has no idea that Naruto would be the worst mark he would ever have. Naruto walked around the tables, looking for an empty chair. He finally spots a man leaving his chair, and Naruto immediately ran to it and sat down. The dealer just stared at the possible new player for a moment. He's terribly underdressed. He looks like he lacks the decorum for this side of the room, judging from the way he, he ran to sit at the recently vacated spot. Nevertheless, the dealer is nothing if not professional. Sir, I would like to inform you that this table has $250,000 buy-in. The dealer said. Oh perfect. I got the perfect table to start. Naruto swung his backpack forward put his hand in, unsealed 250k in cash, placed it on the table, and turned the back again on his back. All of it was done with a broad, goofy smile. This should be enough. Naruto's action garnered a lot of attention from the table. Some were amused, others were offended, but the dealer remained professional. He just took the money and replaced it with chips. 50 pieces of $1,000 chips and 20 pieces of the $10,000 chips. Naruto looked around the table discreetly while arranging his chips. 
There are seven other players on the table, five males, two females. All of them are wearing fancy clothes. Stupid. How could I forget that? The clothes. Why didn't I buy any clothes? I'm standing out like a sore thumb. Wait, I don't need to buy clothes. I have a transformation jutsu. It's a simple enough hand sign. Ugh. Wait, I need to focus. Naruto shook his head and got back to observing his opponents. The table is set up as a half circle with all the players sitting on the curved side, while the dealer is on the flat side. Naruto is sitting on the right end side of the table. Okay, let's work our way around the table, starting with the dude opposite me. Quite young, possibly rich parents. Based on his chips and the amount of nervous sweat he is forming, his parents know nothing about this. The next is a middle-aged guy. He's been cleaning house, almost a million in chips. Have to be wary of him. The following two are chicks. Friends. They also have quite a haul. Either they are good players or good at distracting others. I got to have a closer look at them. Naruto thought of the last part, while blood is running down his nose. Immediately wiping the blood, he looked around the table around more. That guy must be in a losing streak. He only has enough for another two rounds. Okay, next one is an old dude with a hot chick sitting on his lap. Must be incredibly rich to have that hot of a gold digger. Finally, the guy next to me also has a good haul. Naruto finally ended his train of thought. Seeing Naruto is already settled in, the dealer started the game. Naruto was confused when everyone only received two cards. Uh, excuse me. Are there three more cards? Naruto asked is in a low voice. Before the dealer could answer, the old guy with the gold digger laughed hard. What have you been playing squirt is five card draw. Those are for kids and pussies. What we have here is a man's game. Texas Hold'em. The older man said with a loud laugh. Laugh. Naruto immediately felt a feeling of dread washed over him. He has no idea how to play this. You can fold out of the game after the blinds, the five-card poker tables are at the other side of the room if you're interested. The dealer helpfully suggested. Naruto thought about it for a moment until he made a decision. Naruto stood up and shouted. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. I don't back down against any challenge. Believe it. The people in the room just stared dumbfounded at the young man shouting. The security around the room don't know what to do and just stood there frozen. They finally relaxed when the guy sat down. Naruto phased out the world around him and took his guards. He had a ten and a king. Both of them spades. He had been assigned the small blind, which apparently means you have to put $500 on the table, while the guy before him had to give $1,000 cause his the big blind or something. The middle-aged man raised the bet to $5,000. Everyone else called. The dealer finally showed the first three cards, twin aces, clover and a spade, and a queen spade. Naruto just checked since he had no idea what's happening but the older guy had other plans. He raised the bet to $25,000. Naruto had no choice but to see the bet along with the other players. The next card is placed on the table, a queen of hearts. This promoted another round of betting. The rich kid and the unlucky guy both folded. The old dude and the middle-aged guy are continuously raising the bet until Naruto had enough. He placed all his chips on the pot and said. All in. The two girls looked at each other and folded. The guy next to him folded too. Only the old dude and the middle-aged guy met his bet. With no other possible moves for the players, the dealer finally showed the river. It's a jack of spades. Confident with his car.
card, the old guy flipped it over, revealing a nine of hearts and a queen of clover. Full house, queen over aces. The dealer announced. The old guy immediately turned his cards over before the middle-aged dude can collect the pot. It revealed as an ace of diamonds and four of clover. The middle-aged guy immediately slumped. Full house, aces over queens. Naruto's smile was slowly expanding as he watched how Texas Hold'em poker works. Lady Luck still has it bad for him. The old guy was already collecting the pot completely forgetting about Naruto when the dealer spoke. Sir, we still have another player. Him? Really? The kid didn't even know what he's playing. The old guy said. All be God in return was a blank stare. All right, all right. Just hurry up. The dealer turned his head to Naruto and said. Your cards, please. Naruto smiled and placed his card on the table. He looked at his opponent and turned over his card. The old guy looked like he just had a heart attack when he saw the cards. Ace high straight flush. Royal flush of spades. Naruto laughed hard and collected the pot. Several rounds of poker happened similarly. Naruto would win the pot as a whole, or with someone else. One by one, his opponents checked out of the game, seeing they had no chance of winning with him on the table. The management of the Bellagio is already monitoring his games, watching for any signs of cheating. Unfortunately for his opponents, the administration had not seen any signs of fraud. Even replacing the dealer or the card dispenser machine yielded no results. They have no reason to remove Naruto from the game since the house would profit better with a significant encashment transaction compared to multiple small ones. Bellagio Hotel Casino Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005, 2230H local. Naruto has been jumping from a table with lower buy-in to a table with a higher buy-in as he wins more money. Naruto was currently collecting his winnings from the last round in the $10 million buy-in table when a largish man in a suit approached him. Are you the guy who's ripping off all the tables? Hey. I'm not ripping anyone off. I'm just lucky. Naruto defended, ending the statement with a pout. The man just shook his head tiredly and continued the conversation. Anyway, my boss is hosting a private poker game upstairs. He asked me to pick up, and I quote, the kid who's been ripping everyone off the floor below. That's why I'm here inviting you. You can just stay here, but it looks like everyone just wanted to get rid of you. Naruto looked around the table and saw the pleading looks on his opponent's eyes that he says yes. Naruto looked back at the man and asked. How much is the buy-in? One hundred dollar mill, but don't worry. My boss says he's ready to prop you up. He just wants to see something interesting. Your boss is ready to lose at least $100 million? Naruto asked, dumbfounded. He's stupidly rich and bored. Happy said with a shrug. So, what do you say? I don't need for your boss to prop me up. I may have just enough from this table and in my backpack. Naruto collected his chips and placed them all in his backpack. He stood up and faced his opponents and said, Nice game, everyone. I hope we see each other again. Muttered grumblings are all the answer he got in return. Naruto followed the man outside of the poker room towards the elevator. When they finally are alone in the elevator, Naruto finally said, Excuse me, but can I ask your name? Sorry that I hadn't asked your name when we first met. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, by the way. Oh, by the way, who's your boss if you don't mind me asking? The elevator door opened on the penthouse suite. It's all right, kid. I don't want to broadcast downstairs who's my boss. It might get wild. He just wants a quiet night today before he turns in it up tomorrow. 
The man extended his hand toward Naruto. It's nice to meet you, Naruto. I'm Harold Hogan, but everyone just calls me happy. Naruto immediately shook Happy's hand with a grin. For my boss, well, you might know him. Happy hesitated. Don't leave me hanging here. Who is it? Naruto urged Happy to continue. My boss's name is Tony Stark. Happy said, waiting for the kid's reaction. Who?